as people join us, um, let's start and um, opening this, uh, this seminar will be a representative of the government of the Republic of Uganda. Um, Uganda is the, is the host nation and um, we're so sad that uh, we couldn't uh, host you in person uh, because of the ongoing pandemic. But still, um, our first speaker will introduce you virtually uh, so that you feel uh, welcome and at, at ease. Uganda is well known for its hospitality. So um, you'd, um, I'm sure this is the first speaker is going to uh, give you the right setting. And um, our speaker has um, over 40 years uh, in um, various capacities, both uh, the public sector, senior management, banking, and in politics. So I'll just take a snippet bit of his, um, of his resume so you, you see the, the type of gentleman we have. Um, he started in the government of Uganda in 1977. He served as a banker uh, with the Uganda Commercial Bank. He was, uh, he's been a, a bank director for uh, very many years. He's served on the Uganda parliament for a total of uh, 15 years, coming to a close in 2016. He served on the Pan-African Parliament. He's been a um, caretaker minister of state for uh, planning and economic development. He served as a minister of state for finance. He is the current uh, chancellor of um, Eastbat University. He's the board chairperson of Uganda Debt Network. C'est le doyen actuel de l'Université du Président de Prime Microfinance et c'est le Président de... Del... Please welcome with me, uh, Honorable Jacquim Fred March, to officially open this seminar. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mark. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, in your respective capacity, I would like to very warmly welcome you to this international seminar on climate change adaptation and resilience of road networks. Welcome to Uganda. Welcome to Kampala. Réseau routier, bienvenue à Uganda, à Kampala. Kampala de manière virtuelle. Pero estamos muy to, on behalf of the Minister of Works and Transport of Uganda, the Honorable General Edward Katumba Wamala, who has uh, occasioned me to be able to officiate this on his behalf. And I welcome you to, on behalf of the government of Uganda. Uganda distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, is a very peaceful country and I would like to welcome you at the most opportune time to come and physically visit Uganda. Uganda, the pearl of Africa, is a very peaceful country. Uganda is the destination for tourism and would like you to come. We have all the five big uh, heads of uh, the elephants, the buffaloes, the chimpanzees, the gorillas, the lions, including the lions which climb trees. All these are available in Uganda. And of course, we have uh, various species of uh, uh, birds and also a variety of fish. So please welcome to Uganda uh, when the time is ripe. I'd like to take this opportunity to wish and sincerely appreciate and thank all of you who have made it possible for this uh, seminar to take place within these three days, that is from the 7th, 8th, and the 9th. I would like in particular to also thank uh, the Uganda National Roads Authority uh, for co-hosting this event with the World Road Association PIARC, and in a special way, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Mark uh, Rubarenzia and the members of the organizing committee for a work well done. Please keep it on. And of course, we thank all our development partners and the financiers 
for standing with us during this very important uh, activity. Now, as you are all aware, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, the goal of this seminar is to exchange information between countries with a focus on Sub-Saharan Africa, present the necessary recommendations to put in place effective and sound solutions uh, and countermeasures that take into account the peculiar issues of each of these various countries. And I'm sure that during these three days, we shall be in a position to do the needful. It will, of course, include discussions of key learnings and best practice climate change adaptation and resilience examples uh, already implemented by road and transport agencies around the world, while also looking to future considerations. It is also intended that the seminar will provide opportunity to discuss the PIARC International Climate Change Adaptation Framework for road infrastructure and to identify the relevancy and value of to the low and middle income countries. Permit me distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, to highlight the issues that are being going to be uh, handled during these three days. The topics, the first one of course is the infrastructure risk vulnerability and resilience. The second one, the impact of climate change, other hazards and threats on road infrastructure and operations. The third one, building capacity for adaptation, economic, social and environmental aspects of resilience. The fourth, adaptation frameworks, strategies, methodologies and tools. And finally, in the topic, we'll be looking at also the effect of uh, COVID on all this. I am confident, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, that the choice of presenters and the country case studies that will be presented will definitely give us enough insight into why we are going into this. As far as Uganda is concerned, distinguished participants, Uganda is a land-connected country. A number of countries tend to say that Uganda is landlocked. We are connected. We are connected by road. We are connected by rail. And uh, we, with the road's dominant form of uh, transport, the road network stretches across the entire country and is the backbone that has enabled Uganda's rapid economic transformation, transformation over the last 30 years or so. Our roads also provide Trans-Africa connectivity across East African community and beyond, and are therefore essential in the contentment, in the realization of the benefits of the Africa free trade area. However, the climate change impacts are all hazard events are causing more frequent and severe damages to road infrastructure and operations. Today, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Uganda is facing some, a lot of these events that can, events than was the case in the past, and the events are increasing both in intensity and frequency. Just over the last two years, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we have had the, the following three issues, landslides, in the mountainous areas in the west, east, and north, and east, northeastern of, of, of part of the country. Two, we have flash flooding in different parts of the country. And three, the issue of rising water levels of many of our water bodies and rivers. These are some of the things that Uganda as a country uh, has been facing. In response, Uganda is increasingly returning into research and innovation for sustainable and low cost solutions for how to adopt, adapt and ag our existing infrastructure to change to climate change and to make the road network more resilient. Over the, 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 the last three days, the next three days, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, 
we shall be focusing on sharing ways that lead uh, the ways that the road and transportation agencies in your respective countries are making transportation and infrastructure more reliable and uh, a climate change. The final resolutions and actionable recommendations that will arise from your deliberations will be invaluable to the Uganda government and other governments in low and middle income countries. And uh, definitely I'm confident that this will be given all the attention that it deserves during these three uh, days. In conclusion, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I wish to once more invite you to come to Uganda physically and be able to partake of the beautiful country, the Pearl of Africa. And with these few remarks, it is my singular honor and privilege to declare the International Seminar on Climate Change, Adaptation and Resilience of Road Network officially opened. And I say this for God and my country. May you be blessed. Thank you very much, um, Honorable Omach. And um, dear participants, our seminar is uh, officially opened and we shall continue on that same high note uh, to, by receiving um, the speech from the president of the World Road Association. Um, the president is a civil engineer by background, a very experienced professional uh, with uh, multiple years. So I will just summarize and say he spent the first part of his career in uh, Belgian construction companies before uh, heading off to the Belgian Road Research Center. And he was here for 20 years. Um, he is either chair or board member of many European and international technical bodies, uh, for instance, in France, in Germany, in the United States, and um, he has devoted his last 20 or so years to uh, serving the World Road Association, uh, which um, he now chairs, he now serves as our president since uh, 2017. He's also a committed uh, lecturer at uh, the Université Libre de, Bel de Bruxelles on uh, conceptual management of transport infrastructure. Colleagues, uh, participants, please welcome with me uh, Claude Van Rotten to give his uh, speech. Thank you. Uh, dear Mark, thank you for the introduction. Too honorable, really too, you said too much about me, but it's no problem. Um, it's a pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, to address you some words of introduction of this seminar. I will talk only about Payak, uh, my child, no, not my child, but somewhere my head um, uh, activity since uh, five years as president. Um, I let other speakers, more specialists, to introduce the seminar and to talk about the real problems. Um, I understood that many of you perhaps do not know our association, and I think it's interesting then to take the 10 small minutes to speak about our association. We are an old one, more than 110 years existence. And the idea is exactly what we are going to do to the next days, exchange of knowledge, policy, and practice on all matters related to roads and road transport. And we have 125 member governments all over the globe, and even more countries represented by all the members we have, not only from the government sector. Next slide, please. We have four key missions. Uh, you will be able probably to read that all in detail afterwards, but the mo most important goal is leading international forum for analysis and discussion of the whole spectrum of transport issues, and then identify and develop and disseminate good practices to help the whole world. Important for today also, we consider within our activities the needs of countries with developing economies and economies in transition fully. 
and we go even to the efficient tools for decision, decision making. So we work, next slide please, we work based on 1,200 experts from all the world and more than 80 countries who work in technical committees and task forces. That's the goal, of course, at the core of PIAC, knowledge exchanges. And when that exchange has happened, we disseminate our products widely and they are accessible for everybody. And I will repeat, for everybody, free of charge. You can get them all on our website. PR congresses and events are world-class focus points for this, that dissemination too, of course. Each other, to meet each other is too important. We regret that it's uh, remotely the last times, but we are sure that we will meet again physically. Next slide, please. Some of the, some examples of the reports we publish, there are more than 100 uh, the last times, but I think it's important that you know that it's about road safety audits. We have specific, with specific consideration for low and middle income countries, assessment of budgetary needs and optimization of maintenance of strategies. And of course, we have uh, many uh, aspects, discovered many aspects of the, the COVID-19. And I want to thank Patrick Malejac, our Secretary General, who have led a special team about that. And there are special publications. We have reacted extremely quickly, and not only quickly, but really with important documents. Next slide, please. It is important to know that we have easy access to knowledge through our online manuals. It is not easy to keep them update, but they help really to have a base in the four sectors that you see there. They are very easy to use, and that's very important that you know that. Next slide, please. We have also software, and you probably know, certainly in the African countries, that HDM4 is a primary tool for analysis, planning, management, and appraisal of road maintenance, improvements, and investment decisions. But we have now also a tool for managing dangerous goods transport in uh, tunnels. It's really a, a tendency that we want to increase, even if we know that it's very difficult expensive and to be sure that we keep them updated, but software is important. Next slide, please. We have a plan of activities, of course. More than 100 reports are available, but we must be aware that roads and road transport keep improving. Never forget, because some politicians forget that, that roads represent about 80% of all inland transport are the gateway to remote or rural regions and are key for the equity, inclusivity, inclusivity sorry, and accessibility. And then when I say that, I remember that these were extremely important topics in 2003 when the Congress, the World Road Congress of PIAC was in Durban, organized by our new elected president, Nazir Ali, who will address you some words at the end of this seminar. We appointed because I leave my position in a... Y va a la fin de ce seminar. Yo voy a, a dejar pronto en algún momento mi tarea, pero yo... Very end. Our work is, of course, ongoing on a wide range of topics. They are identified in order to serve the needs of our members and the road community. Next slide, please. We appoint members of uh, technical committees, and we have a strategic plan which covers a four-year period. It reflects not only special issues, but also mega trends. And when you see in yellow, two of the four of them are key issue of this seminar, climate change and resilience. And I should well add that the two blue ones are, of course, always key issues because road safety is a world matter and a permanent worry and action of PIAC. 
and innovation, of course, when we collect the good practice in the, the whole world, it's logical to speak about innovation. Next slide, please. Our strategic plan, I will not go into detail. It's nice that you can check that on the website, but you will see in the first column, TC14, climate change and resilience of world work. That's that suits exactly uh, for the seminar of the three next days. Next slide, please. And as I already introduced, the response to COVID was important, but it may not weaken or stop our efforts to make progress in all the other issues. We have to address societal challenges. We have to make to help to make policy choices to combine all aims. And the base of that is the key issue of PIAC information sharing. We have to give all the information to everybody. We have to help each country with the solutions which are presented by other countries, because we were aware in this crisis that the solutions or the problems are of course the same about COVID, but very different when it depends, because it depends of each country. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, the, we want to, I want to repeat that roads represent 80% of all inland transport, that we want to speak about equity, inclusivity, and accessibility. Important is to reach resilience into road transport. And uh, we realize also that road investments and road maintenance will certainly be part or have to be part of stimulus and recovery pass packages. I like really what uh, OECD has said. Let's now, due to the money that we want to invest perhaps more, is build back better. And many of the projects that would fit the timely targeted and temporary criteria best are likely to be infrastructure maintenance projects, since these can start relatively quickly. That's, um, I don't know why I hear now the French translation. Uh, it's my mother language, which that's true, but I don't need it now. Thank you. Um, it is important also that we work to the environment because we know that vehicles emit 5% less CO2 on well-maintained roads and congested roads emit more CO2. So you see that global outlook is important for us all and let's work together on that. Next slide, please. Roads can help to reach sustainable development goals and be a part of global decarbonation strategy. I talked already about innovation, and we must be aware that there where it is necessary, we have to encourage co- and multi-modality, but not forget including roads in the transport mix. And yes, PIAC is really uh, to address the expectations of the transport J'entends de nouveau la traduction française. A international technical cooperation is really very important. As I said, it's our child. Next slide, please. Well, these are almost the last. Um, I want to insist that we will have also um, remotely and ne our next Congress in Calgary, the World Winter Service, and important to say, Road Resilience Congress. So don't worry, there is no snow in your country. And that Congress addresses many issues about resilience. And it is remotely, so you don't need to travel to Calgary in the snow. You can follow and uh, of course register on the site which is mentioned there. I announced already the seminars of next year, the world seminar, I would say, one about pavement characteristics, SURF 2022, and one conference about the road tunnel operations. All those informations will be, of course, or are already on the website. Right, 
and our next World Road Congress will be in Prague in the Czech Republic. Next slide, please. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Um, it will be my last speech, probably official as president. As I said, the next president, Nazir, will address you some words at the end of the seminar, and he will probably also intervene during the course of this seminar. On my turn, I have the privilege to introduce our new elected vice president. And yes, it is Mark Henry Rubarenzia um, from Uganda. So it's a pleasure to introduce him today as next speaker. Peter. He's the head of research and development of the Uganda National Roads Authority with responsibility for research and innovation with focus on many issues as, as PR. Mark is very active in uh, very organizations. First delegate of Uganda in our association and member, of course, of the Art Technical Committee 1.4. Also active on the international level, as for example, ERB International Co Coordination Council. And my special pleasure, he, he holds a PhD in civil engineering, engineering from a Belgian university in Leuven. That's a privilege to introduce you. Thank you very much and see you again. Thank you, Claude. Um, I will speak uh, on behalf of the um, organizing committee, which I had the privilege of chairing, as well as the advisory committee, which I also had the privilege of sitting on. So on behalf of the organizing committee, I welcome you all to this international seminar and thank you for choosing to join us and hope you will be, um, I hope you will find this a rich watershed moment in uh, your respective road and transport associations. The organizing committee has worked very hard over the past nine months to deliver this event. And we're pleased that uh, such large numbers of delegates registered to attend the, the seminar. It makes it all so worthwhile. So why this seminar and why this time? The seminar is timely given that um, climate change impacts and all hazard events are causing more frequent and much more severe damage to road uh, infrastructure operations. We all can appreciate that in, in countries like ours, in low and middle income countries, disruptions to road and other infrastructure cause, um, uh, they cost uh, farms, they cost uh, households, they cost um, governments upwards of 200 and 200 to 300 billion um, dollars annually. I think that's a conservative figure. So um, it, it's it's not small change. This is a big issue that we have to confront as uh, as a road community. So in designing this seminar, we deliberately ensured that it would be widely accessible and cater for a very diverse audience. So we expected to, to have in our audience um, private and public sector actors, uh, members of academia, and uh, the wider supply chain of stakeholders in, in the road sector. And um, the key objectives of this seminar are to share ways that road and transport agencies around the world are making transportation infrastructure more, more resilient to climate change, as well as to exchange information between countries uh, with a focus on Sub-Saharan Africa. So the lessons needn't be from uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, but if they could be contextualized, then they will help uh, participants, governments, as well as um, um, uh, MDBs and uh, bilateral agencies see how to formulate uh, better solutions for us. So over the next three days, um, speakers, panelists, and all of you members of the audience are invited to share your knowledge, share your demonstrated uh, best practice experiences, and let's come up with solutions uh, to the pressing challenges being faced now by uh, road and transport agencies in our respective question, in our respective countries. Some questions to get us thinking, um, and you may bear these at the back of your minds as you go through the, the next three days is, um, what are the threats and what are the opportunities? 
you know, because uh, as, as uh, professionals, we must be able to define these threats uh, clearly and, and, and uh, know which are the opportunities to be, to be leveraged, you know, and how can adaptation and resilience approaches help uh, asset owners, or asset managers to build, to operate and to maintain uh, their road networks. And finally, what strategies and tools do we have available um, to help us increase resilience? So what strategies and tools do we need to be looking for? So I have a special thanks to the following groups of persons who have made uh, all this possible. Uh, members of, uh, of the organizing committee, of which uh, had the privilege of chairing, as I said, members of the advisory committee, all speakers and panelists who have um, prepared uh, extensively uh, for this for this event, our host government and our host institution, the, the government of Uganda and the Uganda National Road Authority and the respective managements, and all of you delegates who have accepted our invitation to accept this seminar. And remember delegates, you are the reason why we put it together. And so uh, giving you value uh, makes this whole thing worthwhile. So I invite you to be active participants and actively engage through the, the chats, through the Q&A sessions and through the networking breaks. Thank you. And um, it is my honor to introduce uh, our next speaker. Our next speaker, he comes from, uh, from Chile. Uh, he's also a civil engineer with um, quite an extensive uh, resume. So um, he's developed uh, much of his um, recent uh, professional work has been with the Directorate of, um, uh, of Engineering Studies. He, heads the, he has headed the road management department. And um, since 2008, he serves as the head of the National Road Maintenance Department. So as head of that department, he's been in charge of supervision and coordination of uh, road maintenance programs across, um, across the country. Since 2016, he's been working in PIAC as the alternative strategic theme A coordinator for management and finance, and, um, and later the strategic theme um, coordinator and member of strategic planning committee. So he'll tell us uh, a bit more about this. There's um, quite a bit of titles, but um, permit me to um, invite uh, Ernesto Barrera to introduce us and make us feel welcome. Ernesto. Gracias, Mark. Eh, gracias, Mark, por la presentación. Eh, en realidad no tengo tantos títulos, pero sí he trabajado de forma importante aquí en la, en la asociación. Don't have that many titles, but I've been working en la dirección de Vilea de Chile, así que muchas gracias por su presentación. Good afternoon, everybody in the organization in several countries around the country. Good afternoon and good evening. My name is Ernesto Barrera. I'm the strategic coordinator of topic one about uh, road management. And I'm participating here and I want to thank the invitation to this uh, opening session for the International Seminar on Adaptation to Climate Change and Resilience, especially in low and middle income countries. I want to thank the organization for this invitation. I want to mention that this seminar has been organized by PR together with the Uganda National Road Authority that participates in the organization, particularly the organizing committee whose president and leader is Ms. Caroline Evans from the 1.4 Technical Committee, has led this technical committee and in particular the organization of the seminar together with Mark Henry, Fabien Pal Hall, 
Kululeko Leta and Mr. Craig Love, all members of the Technical Committee 1.4. I want to thank you all for the dedication in the organization of this international seminar. And I want to also thank the Council Committee with, with Mr. Mark Henry, Patrick Merleyak, the, gen, the Secretary General, the recently elected uh, President, Mr. Nasir Ali, Olofunso Samorin, also, who is the Secretary General of, or is member of the Secretary General Office of PIARC and has been elected the regional president of PIARC by the African Development Bank, and also Kechi Ombona, a participant also in the advisory committee. In general terms, we have a strategic plan from 2020 to 2023 for PIARC. And as I mentioned, we have strategic topic one about uh, roads with five technical committees and one task force that have been developing their work. And in particular, this technical committee that is led by Caroline Evans is about climate change and resilience of uh, road networks, which is very relevant for the association. And this is divided into two groups of work. One has to do with methodological and holistic advances of climate change and other hazards to resilience and the update of the climate change adaptation framework by PIARC. These are topics that we are going to talk about in this seminar and are very important topics as uh, the president of the association just mentioned, there are four topics that have to do with, uh, with a cross cut uh, look, road safety, innovation, and in particular, the two topics for this uh, seminar, like resilience and climate change, all four topics are very relevant for our association. And that's what ha we have been working on in the technical committee. Some of the final comments, the topics dealt with in this seminar organized by the technical committee 1.4, about adaptation to climate change and resilience of road networks, especially in low and middle income countries, are very important for our association. And in this sense, in these programs of three days, we have decided to abord these subjects with going to approach with different reporters from different world institutions about the climate change risks, resilience, framework, and uh, strategies for adaptation to climate change. We can see the participants from different institutions in Asia and different associations that we have to coordinate with. And we also need to take into account and the uh, United Nations and the World Bank have been approaching these topics together with our own association because there is a concern about the progress and uh, we want to make advances regarding the climate change. And these results are going to be positive, not only for the host countries and the country and the association, but it's going to be a, a push for us to take urgent measures that enable a clear adaptation to climate change and take measures regarding resilience of our infrastructure because the climate change continues to advance. I want to wish much success to this seminar and we are going to pay attention to the important topics that are going to be dealt with in these three days. Finally, I wanted to mention two more important events that are coming up in the calendar. The next event has to do with 
uh, is the, the International Congress on Winter Services and Resilience in Calgary, Canada in February of 2022 and the 27th World Road Congress that is going to take place in October of 2023 in Prague. Both Congresses and particularly the activity for the winter road services has the participation of technical committee four and the and most of the other technical committees that are connected to these topics. So with that, I want to invite you to check the schedule and I hope you can be able to participate uh, in these events. Thank you. I want to extend my gratitude and greetings to the whole organization, the technical committee 1.4 and all of the members of the association that have been part of the organization of this event. Thank you very much and a lot of success for everybody. Thank you, Ernesto. I will uh, immediately um, introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Ms. Caroline Evans. She is the chair of uh, PIAC Technical Committee 1.4, uh, which is on climate change and resilience of road networks. She also serves as deputy chair of the Road Engineering Association of Australia and Australasia. And uh, there she is, a technical she's on the technical committee of uh, resilience and emergency management. Caroline has been active in the activities of PIAC over the last 10 years in the areas of climate change and resilience. She's also involved in um, uh, several other international in initiatives, including the Forum for European uh, National Highway Research Labs. Uh, Caroline has uh, experience in key climate change and resilience projects, focusing on developing adaptation frameworks and providing guidance and best practice approaches to the analysis of vulnerability, criticality, and prioritization of infrastructure investment for the future. Please welcome with me, Caroline Evans. Thank you very much, Mark, for your kind introduction. And I would like to warmly welcome you all to today's event on behalf of the organising committee and also the advisory committee. Uh, now, is it possible to uh, share the screen uh, back again, June? Otherwise, I might be able to share it from my side quickly. Okay, I will share that. Sorry. Yeah, thank you very much, June. Okay, that's wonderful. Thank you very much for that. So as mentioned, my name is Caroline Evans and I work for the National Transport Commission in Australia. And I'm the chair of uh, PIAC Technical Committee 1.4, Climate Change and Resilience Road Networks, which has jointly organized this event together with the Uganda National Roads Authority. Now, by way of introduction, I'll just provide a brief overview of the work program and the activities of this committee. So can we just go back one slide, please? Thank you. So there are many definitions. Sorry, there are. And here are some which we are no doubt familiar with. In the context of climate change, it is recognised that climate change impacts affect many road assets. Hence, consideration of things like traffic operations, uh, the rerouting of traffic and communication to road users and identification of adaptive approaches are all required. There is a need to consider the whole picture and the wider impacts of the transport planning and emergency relief, whereby resilience plays a key role in maximising the economic, environmental and social aspects of transport infrastructure and network operations. So this not only applies to ch climate change events, but it also covers other multi-hazard events, such as ageing of infrastructure, natural disasters, and also pandemics. It is recognised that there are several levels encapsulated in the definition of resilience. So in short, resilience means to plan and prepare for minimising disruptions, to recover rapidly when they do occur, and to adapt steadily to minimise future impacts. Next slide, please. 
So our technical committee comprises of 50 members from over 35 countries globally. This is a small snapshot of some of our members. And as you can see, we have a wonderful group of experts in the field of climate change and resilience who are contributing greatly to the, our terms of reference and work program for our technical committee. Now, PIAC has been involved in climate change and resilience for over a decade now. In 2015, a special project was developed to provide an international climate change adaptation framework for road infrastructure. The aim of this guide was to uh, work through a process of increasing the resilience of networks and assets, and it is designed to be applicable at any scale, such as at the national, the regional, the local, and also the asset specific level. It was also intended to be a practical use for road owners and managers in high and also low middle income countries. So following the work developed on the framework, PIAC saw the need to identify how this framework further captures current experience with adaptation work. So this was the motivation for extending this framework into the next cycle, which was from 2016 to 2019, where a related technical committee developed two reports, as you can see on the screen here. So the first was around adaptation methodologies and strategies to increase the resilience of roads to climate change. And this was based on an extensive case study approach. And the other was to look at the refinements needed to the PIAC International Climate Change Adaptation Framework. And all of these reports are available on the PIAC website. So in this current cycle, we've actually established two working groups. Working group one covers uniform and holistic methodological approaches to climate change and other hazards. This covers the concepts of all hazards and threats and a holistic approach to resilience, whereby the impacts beyond assets across the whole network are considered for all hazards and not just climate change. Additionally, there's also consideration of resilient approaches such as risk management approaches, uh, the socioeconomic impacts of hazards on roads and also resilience management. Additionally, we've established another working group, Working Group 2, which is working on providing an update of the 2015 PR framework. And it, what this is doing is it's taking on board the suggested refinements from the previous cycle, as well as the inclusion of new case studies and approaches not included in the previous framework. And this includes things like criticality assessments and also adaptation pathway approaches. I'd also like to note that this PIAC framework is also a key focal point of our technical committee as part of this seminar series over the next three days, where the application of the framework to low middle income countries and its latest developments will be discussed. Now, PIAC Technical Committee 1.4 is also working in very close association across PIAC and also with other organisations. We've been involved in the PR COVID-19 response team, which was established last year in March to look at the rapid sharing of knowledge and practice on the impacts of COVID-19 on the road transport sector. It's also been identified that resilience is a cross-cutting issue across many related PR technical committees as outlined previously by Claude and also Ernesto. Now, as a result, there's a need to achieve horizontal coordination where we're discussing things like the definitions, the terminology, uh, the approaches, and how these might be co coordinated more broadly across PR. There's also a number of other chairs uh, from the related technical committees listed on this slide that are involved in the panel discussions over the coming days. And this is also highlighting the collaboration across PIAC on the issue of resilience. Now, Technical Committee 1.4 has been actively involved in the 16th World uh, Winter, Road, Winter Service and Road uh, Resilience Congress, which is taking place virtually in February next year, as well as coordination towards uh, the World Road Congress in Prague in 2023. And then finally, there are linkages with other organisations relating to resilience, which Technical Committee 1.4 has been involved in establishing across the AFDB, 
also the BNVI network of experts of Germany, uh, the Road Engineering Association of Asia and Australasia, the EU 4C project, the International Road Federation and the UNECE as examples. So in conclusion, I'd also like to thank the, all the efforts of the advisory committee and also the organizing committee as mentioned, and all the assistance from PIAC General Secretariat in coordinating this event. I'd like to thank you for your attention. And without further ado, I'd like to welcome our first moderator, Dr. Mark Henry Robrenzia to introduce session one. Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you, Caroline. And uh, that marks the end of our um, opening um, session or ceremony of sorts. And so now let's get into the meat of uh, what we're supposed to be doing this, um, these three days. Um, the first session is going to be on um, infrastructure risk, vulnerability, and resilience. And we are going to get um, unique uh, contexts coming in from Africa, Europe, and Australasia. So to set the tone, uh, we're going to have um, somebody who's going to speak to us, Perspectives of Africa, and he is the Regional Consultant for Climate and Green Growth at the African Development Bank, where he supports mainstreaming of climate change and green growth into the bank's operations and policies for East Africa. He has previously served as a technical officer for renewable energy at Community Development Trust and a program, program management officer at Climate Change Adaptation in Africa program and in several other places. Uh, he holds a PhD in forestry and, and uh, nature policy from uh, Wageningen in the Netherlands. So please welcome with me, uh, Robert Ocheng, who's going to be um, presenting a topic entitled Challenges and Opportunities for Climate Proofing Road Infrastructure Projects, African Development Bank Perspectives. Robert, you're welcome. Yes, thank, thanks, Matt, for the warm introduction. So uh, just to repeat, my name is Robert Ocheng and I work for the African Development Bank as climate change and green growth consultant. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So I've structured my talk as follows. I'll give an overview of bank's investment in road infrastructures, just to show how much roads are important in the bank portfolio. Then I will give examples of some of the climate risks and impacts uh, on roads that uh, we grapple with, uh, as well as the relationship between road construction operations and greenhouse gas emission. Then I'll talk about the measures that uh, we normally use to uh, screen projects for climate risks and, you know, putting in some uh, resilience building measures Hablar as well as... Robert as Ocheak. Oui. Hello, I can hear some sound. I hope it's clear. Then I'll talk about measures for greening, uh, greening road infrastructure and lowering the emissions, and then some challenges we face and some ideas on how we can move forward. Next slide, please. So in this uh, 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 graph here, I just want to show uh, that over the last 50 years, the kind of investments that the bank has made, you, you see that uh, the bank has supported over 450 uh, road projects, uh, mostly in the transport sector, uh, and has constructed over 40,000 kilometers of road and uh, about some 30 US, uh, 30 billion US dollars have been investment uh, invested into uh, road, road and transport infrastructure. And this has benefited some 4. 450 million African, uh, Africans across the continent. So what you have here is basically the countries and uh, the specific road projects that have been financed uh, by the bank. So if you look at it, then you see that uh, over the last 50 years, there's been massive investment in road infrastructure development by the African Development Bank. Next slide, please. Now, in, 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 in this uh, particular slide, I just want to show uh, the, 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 the proportion uh, of the various sectors in banks for portfolio. So if you look at Tanzania, uh, the investment, the current portfolio of the bank is something that is in the range of almost 2 billion US dollars. UAE means unit of accounts, and this is the currency of the bank. 
uh, if you translate it to dollar, this roughly translates around 2 billion US dollars. If you look at that portfolio, you see that about 60% of it goes to transport uh, investments. In the other graph, we see the same portfolio, but now in another country, Ethiopia. And in Ethiopia, you see about 34% of almost uh, 1.6 billion US dollars uh, has gone or is scheduled for the transport uh, sector. So these two are just to highlight the importance uh, that the bank places in infrastructure, building infrastructure across the continent, noting very well that uh, uh, investment in road infrastructure is very critical, uh, you know, in uh, uh, facilitating growth uh, across the continent. Next slide. Now, increasingly, uh, even as uh, the bank invests in this uh, infrastructure project, including particularly roads, we, we normally see some um, risks that are climate related or climate induced. So I will uh, take the next. Well, yeah, the risks that are related to climate. This uh, particular road project is a road in Burundi and is supposed to run from Rumonge to Gitaza. And uh, what you see here is uh, this is more or less an added road. It's supposed to be upgraded, but um, and, uh, and the, the challenges that challenges that we have here, we have those risks. Uh, likely, you know, if it rains here, uh, we see that there is possibility that we could have like you know mudslide and things like that. Uh, the, the other figure is the same thing, the, the same figure, the same, the same road uh, that you see, particularly Ch Chenegi 29 plus 100 there, you see from, from ideally that, uh, you know, if, if, if it were to rain or if we had to have maybe something like a tremor, you know, it might collapse. Next slide, please. And then now this is uh, an example from the Comoros. Uh, we all know that two years ago, two or so years ago, you know, we had Ken uh, Cyclone Kenneth and uh, it affected the Comoros. So if you look at the figure on uh, the right, you see that uh, of course that wall there is damaged, but uh, behind the wall next to the power line, you see that there is, uh, you know, uh, uh, some vehicle coming there. Now, uh, th this particular project has faced that particular risk of, you know, destruction from the cyclone. And now uh, the, the, the slope that we see there is not very stable. And so we, we could have maybe something like, you know, again, slides again and affecting this road, blocking and cutting off uh, uh, one part from reaching the other. Next slide, please. And then this is uh, uh, another example in Kenya. Uh, we, we, I'm Kenyan. So we had a, a bridge that was constructed to around the tune of two, two, two million, two billion US Kenya shilling. That is like 200 million or 2 million US dollars. And then uh, after some time we had very massive rains uh, and then uh, the river, you know, uh, 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 you know, overtopped and the, this bridge collapsed. And so that investment more or less went into the West. Of course, luckily it was repaired uh, by the contractor, uh, you know, at no additional cost, but uh, at least uh, the main point here is that increasingly we face this kind of challenges. Next slide, please. Yeah, just to mention again that even as we speak today, for those who are in East Africa, I, I think you have heard in the news of Kenya that uh, there was a bus that was drawn because a river uh, just passed its bundle uh, two days ago, and we have lost over 30, 30 souls in that particular incident. So this is just not to scare you, but just to say that uh, issues of climate change are no longer theoretical, but we feel these uh, particular impacts of, of extreme events actually on the ground. Now I will just give a, 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 a small snapshot of the financial implications of the risk that we, we face uh, globally, but also as a continent. So some estimates say that around 73% of annual damage to Transport infrastructure, including roads, are due to surface and river flooding. Uh, others are due also to coastal flooding and earthquakes, and of course, tropical cyclones, as we, are, we have seen in the case of Comoros, but also uh, recently, Cyclone Idai in Mozambique. Now, in, in 2019, again, uh, Cyclone uh, Idai you know, struck, and in Mozambique, the loss was about 1.3 billion. And uh, out of this, almost uh, 40 or so percent uh, was damaged to road tra transport uh, infrastructure. 
So the projection is that going forward uh, around year 2100, uh, Africa will likely incur costs of up to US, uh, US dollars, uh, 183.6 billion in just repair and maintenance costs, leave alone investments in new, new roads. So we, we, th th that is the context within which uh, uh, our climate work is situated from a very physical climate risk perspective. But uh, uh, road projects are not only prone to climate risks, but they also contribute massively to greenhouse gas emissions. So next slide, please. So, so in, this, in, the, in, the, in this slide, I just want to show the relationship between road construction, road operations, and how they contribute to greenhouse gas emission. I'm sure the figure on the right is very familiar because it is one of those figures you normally see whenever there's talk between emissions from the various sectors across the globe. The red part is about how much of the global emissions come from energy, and that energy includes also transport. So if you look at transport, you see it's responsible for around 16% of total emissions. But if you divide it, you see that of that, uh, about 11 or 12 percent comes from road transport and today we are looking at uh, uh, climate risk but also their contribution to emissions from the transport uh, road transport sector that is globally but if you look also some studies my some of my colleagues still here in Africa uh, you also see that uh, energy which also include uh, uh, use of fossils in uh, transport is a major contribution to greenhouse gas emissions in the in the African continent uh, sometimes you see up to uh, almost 24% coming from that. Next slide, please. Then just to give some ideas, uh, a specific country case studies, the, the figures we have here about emissions from Kenya. So in Kenya, uh, our total emissions around 20, 20, 71 metric tons CO2 equivalent emissions. But if you see most of it is from agriculture, but also uh, the third largest contributor is the energy sector. Now, if you break down the energy sector, you, 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 by, by, by percent contribution, you see it's responsible for about 10% of the emissions of the country. And this is what is cascaded, more or less replic replicated in the other countries uh, in East Africa. Next slide, please. And then uh, if, you, if you break down uh, uh, the, the transport, uh, the, the amount of energy used in the transport sector, then you see that actually there is a heavy use of fossil fuel, particularly in running vehicles and stuff, and this is a major contributor. So what this means is that even as we build resilience, we also need to think of ways on how to reduce emissions that are associated with not only road construction, but also operations of the road, particularly specifically running vehicles. Next slide. Yeah, so, so uh, now uh, with that background, uh, I will talk briefly about what the bank is doing uh, to not only build climate resilient roads or to support building climate resilient road in its regional member countries, but also to lower the greenhouse gas emissions. So one of the things we do, first of all, is that as a bank, we are very cognizant of these risks increasingly. And so the bank has developed uh, policies and operations you know, to, to guide. Uh, I'm sure if you look at the website of the African Development Bank, you have seen what we call our 10-year strategy, which focuses on, uh, on at least uh, through two, two pillars. One is inclusive growth to ensure that growth reaches everybody, including women, youth, and staff. But importantly, also uh, the gradual transition uh, to, low, uh, to green growth and low carbon development. Uh, is provided for as an, uh, a key part of, of our strategy. Basically, in terms of uh, you know building resilience of communities and infrastructure, but also managing physical climate risks and ensuring sustainability. And uh, a crucial part of that is building sustainable infrastructure, including road infrastructure. So with that, uh, the bank has also developed what we call a climate risk management strategy that also guides this work, as well as a climate change action plan, uh, you know, to implement some of the strategies that have been identified. Now, for, for road projects and for any bank operations that is implemented, what happens is that these specific operations are subjected to some elements of climate risk screening. And the bank has developed a tool for doing this, and we call that the bank climate safeguard system. The tool has two components. One is a climate risk screening tool, which basically looks at it and uh, a proposed operation, and look uh, and then makes a conclusion: of what is the likely climate risk to, the, to to that particular project? 
Then once these have been identified, then the next uh, stage kicks in, which we call adaptation review and evaluation. And this gives us, uh, help us to evaluate a range of adaptation and mitigation options that can help us actually lower and reduce or mitigate the physical climate risk for a particular project. Now, once that, that the, the, those adaptation measures have been identified, they are actually incorporated uh, in the design of the road project. Uh, so that if there are some modifications that need to be made in the design materials, material specification and stuff, uh, they need maybe to review the realignment of the road, maybe to avoid very high prone areas or high risk uh, climate risk areas, then that is done uh, before the actual implementation is uh, goes on. In addition to that, we also ensure that uh, part of the budget uh, for this particular road projects actually cut us for investing these additional measures to build resilience and adaptive capacity of the proposed road infrastructure. Next slide. Then, 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 uh, then after that, as I mentioned, we look at the carbon footprint of a given road project. And uh, this is usually a bit complex, but what we try to do is we, we look at the road project. We look at how much emission will be caused during construction. So if it is a, a green field, for example, where you are doing a newer road alignment, of course, you'll clear things like forest and stuff or, or vegetation to give way for the road. But also you'll use this heavy um, road construction machine, machinery that use you know, tons and tons of um, oil. And so we look at what is the likely emission that will be uh, associated with construction. And then during the actual operation of the road, normally you see when the road is open, you have many vehicles that come into play, come in to use the road. So we look at what is the projected traffic on that road and what is the likely emission uh, that they will uh, create. Then we compare with the baseline emission to see whether there will be some element of reduction. Alongside this, you also have things like you know improvement in air quality and stuff. And I remember. Uh, Cloud already mentioned that uh, you know uh, if you have swift movement, there, there is 0.5 percent percent chance that you will lower emissions from um, uh, that, that particular road compared to when there is it is heavily congested. Now here I just give you a preview of some of the tools we use uh, in the bank. We have developed something we call a African Development Bank Greenhouse Gas Accounting Tool, which mirrors more or less the other MDP MDP methodology for greenhouse gas accounting. But sometimes we also use this World Bank developed tool, which we call the road emissions, uh, road emissions optimization toolkit. For traffic emissions, sometimes we use MOVES, which is uh, the motor vehicle emission simulator. I, I think it's developed in the US as in, it's also open source. Now, once we have estimated this, we, we, we try to check whether there will be improvement in per capita emission uh, thanks to the improvement of that road or the construction of the new road compared compared to a baseline C situation. Now, the idea is that uh, as, as part of multilateral, multilateral development banks, the bank is supposed to be Paris align, aligned. That is, the work of the bank should be able to meet the objectives of the Paris alignment, which is basically, you know, to lower uh, increase in global temperature by, you know, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but also to build resilience. Uh, of road projects and other infrastructure to physical climate risk and also the resilience of communities around, you know, to any uh, climate stresses that they may face. Next slide, please. Now, for particular measures to reduce carbon footprint, uh, I think uh, I have also looked at uh, what uh, uh, Caroline presented, uh, the, the literature there. This would be more or less the same with what is pre presented there. But one of the things we do is, OK, if we are going to fell so much trees or, or, or vegetation to clear this, we normally do some kind of offsets and, and we budget for this. In many instances, you see that uh, roads will be accompanied by lighting in the major towns traversed. So what we do is we encourage renewable energy power, so street lights, to reduce uh, the carbon footprints of lighting streets. Then in many instances uh, where we do roads, we also encourage the use of uh, bus rapid transport system uh, or mass public transport systems just to ensure that uh, per capita emission is reduced uh, for example, if I use my own car to go to, to work compared to if I use public transport that carries so more, more people. Then we also provide uh, service lanes to ensure also that, you know, there is the, uh, there is the, uh, the chance that uh, service lanes can provide it for, you know, in our context like Matatus, Daladalas of the East Africa, if you know this. 
Then we also provide some kind of non-motorized uh, transport system. So we encourage uh, construction of bicycle lanes uh, and walkways, again, to also improve and uh, you know, ensure that in short distances, people don't have to use vehicles. And then increasingly, you see there is widespread, widespread adoption or uh, shift towards e-vehicles. So we also encourage adoption of e-vehicles for passengers and freight. And when we do roads, we encourage those authorities, you know, think of providing, you know, charging bays and stuff for vehicles because this is likely to take over in the coming years and it's good that we think of this already at this stage. Then we also support policy and uh, development uh, for mass public transport and for adoption of vehicles. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, but in, in this work, uh, we, we face some challenges uh, that uh, I just want to put out there and then we can discuss. One of them is the issue of lack of uh, adequate data. Uh, even if you want to do climate risk screening for a given road project, I, I, I'm sure you know that uh, GCF has a program, the Green Climate Fund has a program, but they will want you to provide them 30 years of climate data and to show that a given road project is actually vulnerable to climate risk. And we know that here in the region, we have limitation in terms of, you know, carrying some of this detailed uh, analysis. So that is a major constraint. But also if you want to estimate uh, greenhouse gas emission, sometimes data is just not available. And uh, uh, some of us are very uh, uh, climate experts, but we are not uh, uh, engineers. So some of the data that we will need from an engineer's perspective, it's difficult to mine that data and make it available. So we have to rely on road engineers like those represented here. Then some of the tools that I use are very complex. The underlying assumptions are not known. And uh, for this, the main solution here could be if we could look for some locally uh, adapted tools uh, that would be uh, useful. Then you see that there is usually low appreciation and understanding of climate risks to road uh, infrastructure projects, as well as appreciation of their roles in greenhouse gas emission. This ensure, these two mean that sometimes when you propose measures, you sometimes get kind of pushback. Then uh, the issue of in, an inadequate or lacking policy framework and incentives for you know, building resilience and lowering greenhouse gas emission in road construction and operation projects. And finally, that uh, some of the measures that are proposed are considered uh, additional uh, costs. And uh, the, the, this idea that the uh, prevention is better than key is sometimes not taken into account because we already know that if we put in place uh, enough measures, uh, uh, to guard against physical climate risk, we are likely to cut less during uh, the actual operation of that road. Next slide, please. Yeah, but uh, all is not lost. We see a lot of opportunities going forward. First of all, we, we just came from COP26 and we know that there is a recommitment by political leaders across the globe to the climate change agenda. So that in itself, in our view, is a very positive step and an opportunity to ride on. Now, there is also increasing awareness among road authorities, at least the ones in the Eastern African region we work with, of the importance of taking this uh, climate risks uh, into account. And uh, uh, this conference organized by UNRWA is a demonstration of the same. So Mark and team already thank you very much for this uh, particular interaction that you have organized. Then there is uh, increasing finances for financing climate resilience, uh, resilient roads. Yes, oportunidad que sería la financiación de infraestructuras viales que sean resilientes al clima. En, en, eso es muy importante, obviamente. Y en todo el continente tenemos un aumento, obviamente, de la población y nos tenemos que concentrar en las necesidades de los sistemas de transporte público en algunos países ya vemos algunos elementos de política que se están desarrollando sobre estos temas. Próxima transparencia. Quiero final, finalizar mi presentación con esta transparencia y quiero resaltar algo. En el medio vemos eh, iluminación a energía solar en Uganda. Otra de las imágenes es en Kenia, donde tienen unas 
líneas uh, para colectivos y otros uh, son. And then in, in the, the final one to my right is in uh, Tanzania. And you know that in Tanzania, they have a BRT system that so far seems to be working. And so uh, this just to show that some of this already taking root. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Robert. And um, uh, dear participants, we encourage you to um, post your questions or comments, post them in the, in the chat, and um, the speakers will attend to them from there so that this discussion uh, can go on beyond the presentations themselves. So um, next, we shall have a presentation on uh, climate change vulnerabilities, looking at uh, feedbacks from applied studies and insights on uh, methodological tools for road networks. It will be presented by um, two co-authors. One is uh, Dr. Selvi Shoshun, excuse me if I didn't pronounce that well. Um, she holds a PhD in geography and works at uh, CETIC as a project director, working on environmental impacts for both uh, road and uh, rail linear infrastructure. And uh, her colleague is uh, Dr. Marine Lericoles. She holds a PhD in um, economics and works at CETEC as a risk analysis, risk analysis expert in the field of transportation infrastructure. Uh, Marine and uh, Sylvie, you have the floor. Merci beaucoup, merci de cette, de cette belle invitation au séminaire. Nous parlerons donc à deux voix avec ma collègue Sylvie Souchon. Si. Bon. Aujourd'hui, c'est-à-dire de vous faire un retour sur des études que l'on mène au niveau international. And we are going to talk about an issue all of us are interested today. And so we can talk about low and middle income countries and road infrastructure. And so we can have a methodological perspective. I'm going to present a group attack, first of all. This is a multidisciplinary engineer group and an independent. Nous intervenons un grand secteur d'activité. route, mais aussi sur tout ce qui va être ouvrage d'art, des bâtiments, ainsi que dans, dans les projets de développement urbain, donc au niveau national français, mais aussi au niveau international. Et pour cela, nous allons intervenir à, aux différentes phases d'un projet, à la fois euh, les études amont, donc euh, avant la naissance, pendant euh, la conduite du projet, en maîtrise euh, d'ouvrage, en assistance à maîtrise d'ouvrage et en maîtrise d'œuvre, et puis sur le management de projet, ce qui nous permet d'avoir une vision assez globale des sujets et d'autres prises dès le démarrage du projet. C'est pas excellent, s'il vous plaît. Enfin, nous avons signé collectivement une charte d'engagement sur, sur nos valeurs en, fait, en tant qu'ingénieurs et citoyens. Et je le, je le note ici parce que ça nous semble important, c'est dans ce cadre qu'on inscrit notre travail sur la résilience, donc risque et résilience des territoires, où ça nous paraît des, des sujets totalement fondamentaux quand on est ingénieur aujourd'hui, à prendre en compte pour à la fois assurer la protection des populations, donc on le voit bien sur les risques routiers, mais aussi garantir en fait la... Euh, l'économie, hein, la bonne gestion euh, de, de l'argent, on va dire, public et, euh, et privé sur ces projets afin de, de préserver euh, notre capacité à entretenir et à maintenir ces patrimoines. Je vais passer maintenant la parole à, à ma collègue Sylvie Souchon qui va vous présenter euh, les études et leur cadre euh, et leur contexte. Merci Marine. Bonjour à tous. Diapositive suivante, s'il vous plaît. Voilà, donc effectivement, nous allons vous présenter le premier résultat sur deux études qui sont en cours, donc encore des, des résultats confidentiels et qui permettront d'illustrer notre propos. Diapositive suivante. Voilà, 
Donc, le premier, premier exemple de mission d'étude en cours euh, concerne euh, l'évaluation de l'exposition d'un réseau routier au risque climatique et national dans un, un milieu, on va dire, insulaire. Donc, c'est une étude en cours que nous réalisons avec Aria Technologies, des spécialistes des modélisations climatiques, et Actimar, des experts plus en risque, justement, naturel, en, en milieu maritime et côtier. Donc, le, le contexte, l'objectif un petit peu large de, ce, de cette première euh, étude, c'est euh, elle s'inscrit dans la volonté de prendre la mesure du changement climatique pour pouvoir anticiper et protéger l'infrastructure routière euh, nationale des catastrophes na climatiques qui en découlent. Euh, le but, c'est vraiment d'arriver à améliorer la performance du réseau routier face à tous les risques climatiques ou géorisques de plus en plus extrêmes qu'il peut rencontrer, comme par exemple les inondations, les tremblements de terre ou les tsunamis. Donc l'objectif, c'est d'arriver à, à, à aboutir à une évaluation donc, de l'exposition du réseau routier au risque climatique et naturel, à la fois en se basant sur l'évolution euh, historique euh, passée, mais également les projections climatiques futures, et tout cela en, a, en élaborant un outil de gestion du patrimoine routier qui puisse permettre de proposer un outil d'aide à la décision. Diapositive suivante. Voilà, donc les résultats qui sont, euh, qui sont attendus, euh, c'est d'arriver, euh, au travers d'une analyse multithématique, à mettre à niveau un, un système d'asset management du réseau de transport de ces îles, qui existe déjà, mais pouvoir ensuite porter et soutenir le développement du réseau routier national en priorisant les investissements de rénovation de certaines sections ou de certaines liaisons routières. Donc ce projet-là, il se répartit en quatre phases qui en fait se complètent. Il y a par exemple une première phase de descente d'échelle des modèles climatiques à différents horizons, puis une phase de modélisation hydraulique et hydrologique, euh, ensuite la production de cartes multi-aléas, et enfin la quatrième phase, euh, sur laquelle nous intervenons plus particulièrement, qui va être de définir la vulnérabilité et la criticité du réseau routier, avec en plus une analyse des risques. Diapositive suivante. Voilà, donc la méthodologie de cette, de cette phase 4, elle repose sur deux étapes principales. La première étape, donc une étape toujours très importante, c'est la collecte et l'évaluation des données. Ensuite, la cartographie du réseau routier sous système d'information géographique. Et ensuite, l'évaluation de la criticité et de la vulnérabilité de chaque section de route du réseau. La deuxième étape, elle, elle va consister en une analyse des risques de toutes ces sections de route par rapport aux dangers naturels. Ensuite, la notation des tronçons routiers critiques en fonction de leur vulnérabilité et de leur exposition aux risques naturels. Et enfin, on conclut vers un, un scoring pour pouvoir hiérarchiser les tronçons les plus exposés aux aléas naturels les plus fréquents ou les plus intenses. Diapositive suivante. Alors, la, le deuxième exemple de mission, qui est également en cours, euh, qui concerne une autoroute, un projet d'autoroute situé en Afrique de l'Est. Euh, en fait, c'est un, une mission qui porte sur des compléments, des études complémentaires euh, qu'il faut réaliser sur une étude d'impact environnemental et social euh, au stade d'un projet de construction d'autoroute avant sa mise en concession. Ce qui est intéressant dans cette mission, c'est que euh, nous sommes amenés, nous sommes consultés pour réaliser plusieurs compléments, alors des compléments classiques pour ceux qui connaissent les études d'impact, par exemple la modélisation des impacts acoustiques, euh, l'impact sur les eaux superficielles et souterraines, l'étude sur les déplacements de population ou sur le patrimoine culturel. Et il y a une mission complémentaire très intéressante qui, elle, porte justement sur l'évaluation des risques liés au changement climatique pour le projet qui va être construit. Donc, le contexte de cette mission 2 spécifique, c'est justement de pouvoir euh, davantage et beaucoup mieux prendre en compte le climat actuel et, fut et futur qui pourrait avoir euh, des incidences sur le projet. Donc c'est cette évaluation euh, complète au changement climatique euh, qui doit être menée. 
Diapositive suivante. Donc, dans ce, dans ce cadre-là, nous avons travaillé, nous travaillons encore avec une sous-traitance locale. Euh, et la méthodologie de cette mission est la suivante. Euh, L'évaluation doit, dans un premier temps, prendre en compte les caractéristiques locales des territoires qui sont traversés par l'autoroute. Euh, et cela, euh, pour l'ensemble de la durée de vie du projet, de sa construction jusqu'à son démantèlement. Euh, le profil du risque climatique élaboré par la Banque mondiale, à travers un outil qui s'appelle le Think Hazard, permet de disposer d'informations qui sont contextuelles sur les événements climatiques antérieurs et les projections climatiques futures pour les, les territoires traversés. On obtient déjà un contexte de toutes ces évolutions climatiques potentielles. Diapositive suivante. Euh, plus précisément, donc, cette mission d'évaluation des risques climatiques euh, est réalisée selon les phases suivantes. Tout d'abord, une phase où on passe en revue, où on screen tous les aléas qui peuvent être liés euh, au climat. Et ensuite, dans un second temps, on va justement évaluer les risques qui sont liés au changement climatique. On va sélectionner les aléas les plus évolutifs, ceux qui vont le plus changer. Donc, On va identifier les différents impacts possibles sur le projet, donc sur des éléments euh, très, euh, très techniques. Et on va enfin évaluer euh, les risques, les risques associés, et surtout rechercher des mesures d'atténuation euh, qui, euh, qui peuvent être approfondies, puisqu'il est encore temps, puisque le projet n'est pas encore passé en études détaillées. Diapositive suivante. Voilà, je repasse la, la parole à Marine. Merci Sylvie. Et c'est vrai que le fait de pouvoir mener des études sur différents pays avec des problématiques qui sont assez proches, et pour autant les commandes sont différentes, ça, ça nous permet de réfléchir à une mise en perspective méthodologique. Et, et dans ce cadre, on a trouvé intéressant de, de soulever trois points pour, pour les études à venir et, et celles que l'on mène actuellement. D'une part, l'importance hein, de mener une analyse complémentaire entre la criticité d'éléments qui sont propres euh, plutôt à la vie humaine, et je, je reviendrai plus dans le détail, avec la vulnérabilité physique de l'infrastructure en tant que telle. Un deuxième sujet sur euh, la complémentarité d'une étude approfondie sur les risques climatiques euh, en complément du coup de l'étude d'impact dont vous venez de parler. Et puis, un troisième sujet sur la pertinence de l'outil de SIG Web Mapping pour pouvoir avoir une visualisation un peu plus facilitée pour l'être humain des résultats de différentes cartes qu'on met en œuvre. S'il vous plaît, la, la diapositive suivante. Alors, sur le premier aspect méthodologique qui nous semblait important, c'est donc la complémentarité, hein, mener une analyse de vulnérabilité sur une infrastructure routière. Ça nous semble intéressant d'avoir bien ces deux approches et euh, qui vont nous permettre en fait, de hiérarchiser euh, nos investissements prioritaires ou nos mesures prioritaires. Alors ces deux approches, je les, je les rappelle, hein, on a d'une part, alors ça va plutôt être en bas de la slide, euh, la, la, la prise en compte en fait, d'une criticité. Cette criticité, ça va être les facteurs de, de vie humaine, entre guillemets. Donc, la population, hein, le fait qu'une infrastructure à proximité immédiate euh, de, de poches de population ou de grands centres euh, de, de ville. Euh, on a aussi les, les, les indicateurs socio-économiques. Donc là, on a pu être en rapport avec le poids économique euh, de la zone traversée. Est-ce qu'on a des, des centres commerciaux Est-ce qu'on a des centres d'emploi Est-ce qu'on a des euh, lieux stratégiques, euh, euh, notamment euh, voilà, d'autorité les questions environnementales aussi hein, qui peuvent être prises en compte. Alors, on pense euh, aux zones euh, éventuellement protégées au titre de l'environnement, mais aussi euh, pour certains pays, les zones touristiques. Et puis enfin, dans cette approche euh, menée sur les îles, a été pris en compte un, un critère sur euh, les, euh, les axes de sauvegarde, en fait, les, les axes, les, les issues de secours, en fait, les, les voies principales pour les secours, ce qui permet aussi de hiérarchiser un petit peu les et les voix entre elles par rapport à ces critères-là. Et donc, l'ensemble de ces critères est sommé selon les cas, puisqu'on peut avoir des, des cas où euh, certains critères vont être pondérés, avoir plus d'importance que d'autres, et donc il faudra être attentif dans une lecture globale des résultats euh, pour ne pas fausser euh, euh, ce, ce qu'on appelle le, finalement la, le, le seuil hein, de passage en critique ou euh, en moins critique. Et puis, on va compléter cette approche avec l'approche sur la, la fragilité euh, intrinsèque de l'infrastructure. Donc là, on peut passer à la slide suivante, s'il vous plaît. Euh, 
c'est un peu petit, mais euh, sur cet aspect de fragilité, en fait, on va s'intéresser euh, aux caractéristiques physiques de la route. Euh, et donc, notamment, est-ce que cette route euh, comprend une pente Est-ce qu'elle a un système de drainage Est-ce qu'elle est en bon état, en bon état d'entretien également Et ça va nous permettre aussi de euh, caractériser euh, l'infrastructure étudiée euh, dans euh, des catégories de risque. Hein, donc ici, avec une échelle à, à, trois, à trois niveaux, avec euh, bas, moyen et haut risque. Et donc, on va avoir donc l'affrontement entre guillemets, enfin la complémentarité entre les critères que j'ai numérés précédemment sur la criticité et puis ces critères de fragilité physique, ce qui nous amène à des résultats. Si on peut passer à la slide suivante, s'il vous plaît. Et ces résultats, euh, donc là on a pris quelques exemples pour euh, pour illustrer notre propos, mais Là où c'est intéressant, c'est qu'ils vont d'eux-mêmes faire apparaître en fait, un, un nivellement, une hiérarchisation des investissements entre guillemets, à, à traiter ou des mesures à traiter. Donc, si on prend le, le schéma à gauche, le plan à gauche, là, on va s'intéresser à des critères plutôt humains, euh, en l'occurrence plutôt euh, euh, le poids de population euh, dans, euh, par rapport au territoire. Et donc, on va avoir un, un code couleur qui va faire apparaître en bleu euh, ce qui est... Euh, ce qui est critique au sens humain, c'est-à-dire ce qui relie le plus de populations ou de centres, là on parle aussi des centres d'éducation, etc. Et donc on voit que c'est ici le réseau plutôt côtier, plus les grandes pénétrantes qui va être d'importance capitale au regard de ces critères. Si on compare avec le schéma à droite, là on s'est intéressé davantage à la fragilité de l'infrastructure donc les, les critères que, que j'ai énumérés précédemment sur voilà, la présence de pentes l'entretien, le niveau d'entretien euh, etc et eh bien là le code couleur est inversé et donc ce qui, euh, ce qui est le plus vulnérable c'est ce qui est en rouge euh, et donc on voit apparaître entre les trois couleurs possibles en fait un, un autre réseau capillaire hein, un deuxième réseau euh, qui, est, euh, qui est moins euh, Enfin, en moins bonne condition que, que le réseau côtier qui était aussi le plus important d'un point de vue euh, humain, hein, des, des caractéristiques humaines de population notamment. Et donc, ce qui est intéressant là, c'est que si on va dans la finesse de l'analyse, et eh bien, alors déjà, premier élément, on voit que la bonne nouvelle, c'est que les, les infrastructures sous cet exemple euh, prioritaire ont été celles qui sont en meilleur état. Donc, ça, c'est intéressant en tant que tel et c'est plutôt rassurant. Mais parallèlement, on va voir qu'on va avoir des subtilités dans le réseau capillaire secondaire et que ça va nous permettre de prioriser en comparant, donc, bien sûr, différents éléments. On a d'autres cartes avec d'autres critères et ça va nous permettre d'avoir véritablement une approche complète de la problématique qui, que pose en fait la résilience à ces, à ces aléas climatiques sur un, un système de réseau. Et donc, ça nous semblait important de soulever ce point. Je vais passer à la slide suivante, s'il vous plaît. Sur le deuxième aspect méthodologique, on a, et Sylvie l'a d'ailleurs souligné, on a mené donc une étude complémentaire à une étude d'impact. Et on s'est intéressé notamment sur ce projet autoroutier en Afrique de l'Est à d'autres variables climatiques qui ne sont pas systématiquement prises en compte dans une étude d'impact classique de préparation de projet. Et donc, notamment, on s'est intéressé à la question des crues, donc c'est les premiers descendants à gauche, à la question des glissements de terrain et puis à la question de, de la chaleur extrême qui sont donc autant d'aléas climatiques qui peuvent perturber l'infrastructure future et qui doivent être pris en compte dans sa construction, dans son élaboration. Et donc, sur ces variables, eh bien, on a mené des analyses territoriales pour voir effectivement dans quelle zone de gravité, enfin, quel, quel, quel indice allait traverser le projet. Et ça nous donne des éléments qui sont, qui sont donc évidemment complémentaires, puisque pas étudiés dans un premier temps à notre étude d'impact. Slide suivante, s'il vous plaît. Ce qui nous a permis, alors bon, le tableau est un petit peu fastidieux à lire, mais l'idée essentielle derrière, c'est de dire qu'une fois qu'on a fait ça, ça nous a permis pour ce projet de nibler une fois encore les, les risques principaux qui pourraient apparaître sur l'infrastructure à venir et les caractériser en plusieurs catégories, notamment pour orienter le maître d'ouvrage et le constructeur vers des études approfondies sur des risques qui seraient les plus, les plus importants, donc notamment tout ce qui apparaît en rouge. Et ça a permis de, de faire un nouveau screening en fait, des risques, une nouvelle analyse des risques, pour, pour 
être en mesure d'aller plus loin. Donc, ça nous semble tout à fait pertinent, puisque ça complète habilement ce qu'on peut réaliser par ailleurs. Et c'est de nature, une fois encore, à rassurer, enfin en tout cas, à instaurer un climat correct par rapport aux performances de l'infrastructure autoroutière à venir, de préciser ces valeurs. Je vais repasser la... La parole à Sylvie pour terminer sur nos euh, évaluations méthodologiques. Diapositive suivante. Voilà, donc le dernier point, effectivement, euh, méthodologique dont on voulait euh, vous, vous parler, euh, c'est euh, là, on, on est à, à la fois sur un, euh, un élément euh, euh, donc un, un, méthodologique, mais euh, pour mieux en fait illustrer et mieux pouvoir accéder aux résultats euh, de ces différentes études. Euh, les études, quand on, on travaille sur euh, les sujets euh, de, de vulnérabilité euh, au changement climatique, on se retrouve en fait euh, très rapidement à devoir croiser beaucoup d'informations. Euh, là, on a pris on, on a pris un exemple euh, de toutes ces, ces représentations doivent être euh, cartographié et on a on doit croiser par exemple différents horizons temporels on doit croiser différents scénarios euh, et on s'intéresse aussi à un certain nombre de, de variables euh, et donc à chaque fois c'est une accumulation de cartes euh, qui éventuellement n'ont pas forcément la, la même échelle on souhaite pouvoir faire des synthèses on souhaite comme euh, euh, à essayer de vous le présenter juste avant Marine, on essaye de, de croiser des, des cartes. Euh, tout ça pour vous dire donc on arrive toujours à beaucoup de, de cartes qui sont produites. Euh, ce, qui est, ce qui est intéressant, c'est d'avoir un, un outil. Alors, on a la puissance du SIG, mais on peut aller encore un petit peu plus loin. Euh, c'est pour rendre ce SIG encore plus dynamique et pour avoir du coup une, un vrai outil d'aide à la décision pour pouvoir afficher euh, beaucoup d'informations euh, et assez rapidement. Donc, slide suivante. Voilà, donc le, le web mapping à partir de l'outil euh, SIG, il permet de partir de cette production cartographique euh, d'identifier en fait les, les besoins. Based on the production of maps, enables us to identify the problems. So as to have a web mapping that is going to respond to the needs, we start working on very accurate analysis, and this enables us to manage the project in a more effective way. Here we want to explain the dynamic access to information in our surveys, which enables us to better understand the results. We have proposed a more effective tool with this, with, with this web mapping. This is a more effective tool to take decisions. Thank you very much. The conclusion of this uh, presentation is that we want to highlight some of the points that are very important. One, as you can see, we tried to build an integrated response, not only to think about or to start with the means that deal with the serious climate change events in a more sustainable way too, but also to deal on a day-to-day -day basis things that have to do with um, operation and management and maintenance in a more resilient way. That is the framework for our surveys, deal with the climate events, but also uh, have a, a resource for these projects. And also we want to highlight that this work helped us share the surveys that we did on climate change and risks in general, uh, share them on a network that will enable us to have... 
de la construction d'un projet pour prendre le maximum de dimensions en compte. Et on pense aussi que c'est ça, hein, la perspective, au-delà de, du changement climatique, la résilience en tant que telle, c'est bien un thème qui, qui demande une approche multiriste. Et c'est euh, enfin, ce qui nous semble, c'est en tout cas dans le cadre de cette perspective qu'on inscrit notre action. Merci beaucoup. Merci à tous. Thank you, Marine and um, Sylvie. Uh, certainly very thought-provoking. I invite uh, all of you to uh, pose your questions or comments to Marine directly uh, in the in the chat. And uh, if you'd like to further this conversation with them, uh, please um, do that in the chat or pick their contact information. That's what this uh, seminar is all about. It's about exchanging uh, information as well as exchanging contacts and, and connections so we can build uh, the connections that are going to make a better world. So our next uh, presentation is going to be on asphalt pavement, high temperature regulation for climate change adaptation. And uh, we have just the man for that. Uh, Dr. Yangho Miao is a professor at the National Center for Material Service Safety at um, the University of Science and Technology, Beijing. And he's also a member of uh, PIAC's Technical Committee 1.4. Uh, prior to joining the university, he was um, associate professor at uh, Beijing um, University of, uh, um, of Technology. He's been actively conducting research in road engineering for very many years, and some of his current interests include uh, road service environment and performance, resilient roads and climate change adaptation, pavement structures and materials. Uh, please welcome Dr. Miao to speak to us. Thank you. Well, thank you for your kindly uh, introduction. Uh, on the Good morning and good afternoon and good evening, everyone. Uh, today, I would like to uh, make a presentation about the asphalt pavement high temperature regulation for climate change adaptation. In China, asphalt pavement is the most popular type of high grade road pavement. And asphalt pavement is very sensitive to the climate conditions global warming context, we should take effective measures to mitigate the change. At the same time, we also should try to find a way to adapt the climate change. Next, please. Next slide, please. Okay, this is the outline of my presentation. It's a briefly background and the uh, introduce of the influencing uh, factors and the regulation, uh, regulating approaches of the asphalt pavement temperature. And then we will review the pavement temperature regulation uh, technology in the practice. So that's all uh, outline. Next, please. Yeah, IPCC released uh, uh, some reports for the six uh, round climate change assessments. It is shown human induced climate change is already affecting many weather and the climate. Yes, okay. okay, the human induced climate change is already affecting many weather and the climate extremes in every region across the global. And evidence of observed changes in extremes has strengthened since assessment round five. And the human induced warming reached approximately 1.2 Celsius degree above pre-industrial pre, pre -industrial level. Next, please. These are some data observed in China. Uh, the, the, top left, the top left figure is the uh, annual national mean temperature. It, we can easily see the increase, increase in trend, especially after 
1985. The top right show uh, the normally our sea level of China coast. China coast, we can see a 100 millimeter increase since 1980. And the bottom left is uh, uh, the is the frequency of extremely extreme high temperature events. We can see a significant increase of the uh, of the extremely high temperature uh, events. As the blue blue book on climate change in China, the extreme low temperature events have decreased, and the extreme high temperature events have increased significantly since the mid 1990s. Next, please. In the performance predictions uh, of asphalt pavement design specification of China, there are some temperature related coefficients. These slides, this slide shows two of them with significant change. This is the uh, top left. Uh, is the equivalent to here related to the permanent deformation of asphalt. Pavement. We can see before 1992, the equivalent kept relatively steady. After that year, it, it increased significantly. That means the increase of permanent in the pavement performance uh, prediction model. So as of the payment design on China. So um, some temperature related coefficients, uh, this slide shows two of them with significant change. The left one is the, is the equivalent temp uh, temperature, which is uh, for the prediction of permanent deformation of as for the payment. And the left one is the, the low design temperature of as for the payment. Uh, which is uh, about the thermal cracking of asphalt pavement. We can see um, there's a significant increase of the temperature, uh, the equivalent temperature, uh, but a uh, uh, different trend of the low temperature, low design temperature of asphalt. Et nous observons une tendance. Porque se había prestado más atención al diseño para bajas temperaturas. Por supuesto, podemos aceptar este desafío utilizando materiales que tengan mejor desempeño. Por otra parte, también podemos responder a este desafío regulando la temperatura de los asfaltos. Aquí en esta transparencia estamos mostrando los diferentes factores que inciden sobre el desempeño del asfalto y los podemos categorizar entre factores externos y factores internos. Los factores externos incluyen la temperatura del aire, la radiación solar, la radiación inversa atmosférica y la velocidad del viento, humedad, etcétera. Y los eh, factores internos tienen que ver con la absorción o, o el reflejo de la radiación solar, la conducción o inducción del calor y la radiación de los materiales, además de la convección térmica. Eh, hemos estado utilizando eh, estos factores para regular la temperatura del asfalto y para poder ajustar los factores que influyen de manera interna, porque los factores externos tienen que ver con el medio ambiente y nos resulta difícil ajustar eh, estos factores. Entonces podemos ajustar los factores de influencia interna para poder regular qué pasa con la temperatura del asfalto. Hay cinco enfoques que podemos utilizar en la práctica. Uno es mejorar eh, la capacidad de reflexión de la superficie y el otro es mejorar la resistencia para poder enfriar el pavimento de, de asfalto. También podemos de alguna manera mejorar o corregir la transferencia calórica para poder 
de esa manera enfriar los pavimentos de asfalto. These slides show some approaches to uh, uh, some uh, some approaches to enhance the reflection of the pavement surface. Uh, the typical coating, uh, uh, the uh, the coating materials using uh, some coating materials uh, with with uh, a higher uh, reflection rate is a uh, uh, is a traditional uh, is a typical way. Uh, we can see a very uh, uh, significant effect uh, from the uh, in the practice. Next, please. This table we summarized the uh, cooling effects so, uh, of uh, this kind of uh, the uh, typical coating materials. We can see uh, some research recorded a 20 Celsius degree reduction of asphalt pavement high temperature. It should be noted that the cooling effect depends on the weather, the season, and the location. In addition, the durability of the uh, the durability of the coating still uh, needs to be improved, and the skid resistance of pavement might be compromised by the coating materials. Next, please. Uh, we can also uh, regulate the asphalt pavement temperature by enhancing the. Uh, by increase the thermal uh, resistance. From this, kind, uh, from this equation, uh, we can see the smaller thermal conductivity and the higher thermal resistance. In practice, alternative aggregates with low thermal conductivity are usually used to achieve the regulation. So next, please. Why? These slides show some reported cooling effects of cooling effect date. The temperature reduction uh, can reach more than seven uh, Celsius degree. At the present, the ma major problem of this way uh, is the performance of the alt alternative aggregates is usually lower than that of the traditional aggregates. So the asphalt pavement performance will be compromised by the uh, alternative aggregates usage. So next, please. We can also use uh, uh, water. Uh, the water evaporation will be uh, uh, take some heat from the uh, asphalt pavement. It can from the, uh, the water can from altering or from retain the water by the pavement with water retaining materials. The mixture type of the pavement also affects the cooling effects. Permeable pavement has better cooling effects than the traditional pavement. This is mainly because the water can enter the interior of the permeable pavement. So more heat can be taken away by the water evaporation. In, in addition, the air, the air oils of permeable pavement can also increase the heat change area. And that can fast the heat exchange between the water and the asphalt pavement. Next, please. So this table lists some typical cooling effects. The so ordinary uh, permeable pavement can achieve a less than four Celsius degree reduction. So auto retain uh, pavement can achieve a, a significant effect, a 9.5 Celsius degree reduction was reported in the literature. Uh, that's because the water uh, retained the materials can retain water for a relatively long time. So 
the cooling effect will uh, will be uh, have a, uh, will be um, will be a long time. So next, please. Uh, there are many kinds of systems was proposed to harvest the heat energy that will uh, that also can regulate the asphalt pavement. The road thermoelectric generator system uh, is one of these uh, is a typical one. This system can using the temperature difference between pavement surface and the bottom to generate electric power. In that process, the pavement temperature will be influenced because the heat energy was converted to the electric energy. Another typical system is the heat exchange system. It depends on some kinds of fluid to extract the heat of pavement through a set of pipes embedded in the pavement structure. The collected heat in summer can be stored and reused in winter. So this kind of system can regulate the temperature, the high temperature and the low temperature of the asphalt pavement. Next, please. There are some so are some disadvantages for these two approaches. For the thermoelectric generator, the major problem is the conversion efficiency. By now, the conversion, the energy conversion efficiency of these uh, of the systems is uh, relatively low. And the, uh, for the uh, for the system or heat exchange, the disadvantage is, is uh, from the pipes embedded in the pavement structure. Uh, that will uh, increase the, increase, uh, the complex uh, city of the pavement construction and the maintenance. So next, please. Next, please. So using the uh, using the uh, phase change materials to uh, is a another is another effect uh, effect uh, effect way to regulate the temperature of asphalt uh, of asphalt pavement. The heat energy can be stored in the form of a latent heat, and the system temperature may keep relatively constant. Based on these principles, we can regulate the temperature of asphalt pavement by adding phase, mat phase change materials to asphalt mixture. The pavement temperature rises with the absorption of solar energy and reaches its phase transition point. Then the phase change materials will, uh, will uh, house will uh, bring the effect of regulation and the solar energy and the absorbed solar energy will be stored will be stored as latent heat in the phase change materials the reported pavement temperature reductions are up to about nine celsius degree so next please This table summarizes the uh, common use the phase change materials and the carrier materials. We can see the phase change temperature and the phase change and selfie and selfie of these materials are very different. It means we need more work to get better solutions of this of this kind of way. So next, please. So uh, this is a briefly summary of the uh, approaches to regulate asphalt pavement high temperature. It is feasible to adapt to climate change through regulating the high temperature of asphalt pavement. However, 
it still needs a lot of work to improve the problems such as cost, the durability, performance, and the stability. In practice, the, spe uh, specific, the specific aims and the local conditions should be fully evaluated for decision making. Uh, and the, uh, we can use various, uh, various approaches in one project to get better effects uh, of payment as well, uh, of payment temperature regulation. Oh, that's all. That's all my presentation. So next, please. Next, please. Thank you. Uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Yinghao, for a very enlightening presentation. Uh, once again, I encourage uh, us all to uh, ask questions, uh, give comments in the chat. I, I have already noticed some are ongoing. Uh, this is really what we're here for. Uh, I also ask that um, all members of the of the audience, please keep your mics off and um, where possible, um, include your, your name and country so that uh, much as we're virtual, we can still uh, know who we're interacting with and it makes it feel a little bit more cozy. So um, our next speaker in this session has already spoken before, so I will not um, belabor her inter introduction. This is Miss um, Caroline Evans. I will just mention that um, she is a principal policy advisor with the National Transport Commission of Australia. And she's going to be giving us an overview of um, RE AAA climate change and resilience activities. Welcome, Caroline. Thank you very much, Mark. And good afternoon again to all of you. And thank you for the opportunity to present today. So my presentation will be on providing an overview of the work being conducted by the Road Engineering Association of Asia and Australasia, also known as RAAA, on climate change and resilience activities. So in particular, it will focus on the alignment of a newly formed RAAA committee and the connections which this has with PIAC in the area of climate change and resilience of roads. So by way of introduction, uh, RAAA was set up in June of 1973 with a permanent secretariat in Malaysia. It has more than 1,400 members in about 24 countries and holds regular events, including events such as the annual Heads of Road Authorities meeting, uh, triannual uh, international conferences, uh, technical visits and study tours, seminars, forums, and also workshops. Its function is primarily to promote road engineering and related professions in the Asia Pacific region through the development of professional and commercial links within and between countries in the region. Additionally, local RAAA chapters have been set up in several countries, such as in Australia, Brunei, uh, Korea, Malaysia, New Zealand, and also the Philippines. So in terms of the structure of my presentation, I'll first provide an overview of why the topic of climate change resilience is important, not only in Asia and Australasia, but to also reflect on some worldwide challenges of climate change events on road infrastructure. I'll then highlight the main aspects of the RAAA Committee on Climate Change Resilience and Emergency Management, which has been formed to address these issues. I then I'll discuss some key issues of RAAA and the technical committee with a focus on building on the findings of a scanning tour which took place in South Korea and Japan relating to resilient infrastructure. And then next I'll provide a summary of the connections between PIAC Technical Committee 1.4 and 1.5 disaster management. And finally, I'll talk about some collaborative opportunities in the area of resilience between the associations. 
So this slide outlines why the issues of climate change and resilience are important to address. There are a multitude of climate change and other hazards that are occurring worldwide. So some examples, as you can see, are provided here with the occurrence of floods, droughts, typhoons, cyclones, hurricanes, and other hazards. So as everything in this world is interlinked, there are widespread drivers across poverty, inequality, population densities, which correlate directly to the impacts from a variety of hazards, whether they be biological hazards such as COVID-19 or climatic in nature. This can all result in an increase or amplified effects of various hazards on transport infrastructure and network operations. So for example, it is recognized that the COVID-19 pandemic was an event which had a very low probability in occurrence, but it has had very high consequences at economic and social levels as we've seen. So as road networks, transport and, and intermodal transport are already complex in themselves, there are additional impacts which hazards impose. And these can result in amplified effects where the reduced capacity to handle one problem increases the risk of another problem. Here, the COVID-19 situation can amplify the effects of other climatic threats which are occurring. So for example, other hazards such as landslides, storms, earthquakes are still occurring in the face of COVID-19, leading to further complexities to owners, operators and society. So resilience is an important area for RAAA. As a result, a new committee was established, which aligns with the PIAC terms of reference for both Technical Committee 1.4 and also 1.5 Disaster Management, which is led by Yukio Adachi from Japan. In a sense, this committee has been set up as a mirror group to enable the concepts of resilience to be integrated across both associations. This is not because not all uh, member countries are the same in each association. So there, there is a real benefit of learning about other countries' experiences. So the aim of this committee are essentially to address the issues of concern to RAAA member countries in the areas of infrastructure resilience to climate change, where relevant mirror the topics addressed across related technical committees from PIAC and to act as a liaison between RAAA and member countries. So the connection points can be seen on this slide here where the RAAA work plan is identified and it shows the dissemination of the information on adaptation strategies, climate change adaptation frameworks and the sharing of information and case study examples relating to natural disasters between the associations. The work plan of this committee also provides an opportunity for more specific key issues in Asia and Australasia to be explored further, with the aim to develop two additional reports throughout the cycle. The first is to extend recommendations and issues identified in a scanning tour on infrastructure resilience. And the second is to produce another report that is looking at identifying how climate change resilience can be implemented into asset management and strategic decision making processes. So a number of years ago, a scanning tour was conducted by the Forum of European National Highway Research Laboratories, also known as FERL. And this was undertaken to South Korea and Japan, and a subsequent RAAA technical report was published in 2018. This report outlines the research priorities in South Korea and Japan, and the key approaches and learnings to enhance infrastructure resilience. And it's divided into four components, as you can see on this slide here, around preparedness, robustness, recovery, and also adaptation. The report also features presentations and case study examples and key findings from the scanning tour. So this slide provides a summary of some of the key outputs from the report. There are examples of preparedness where in both South Korea and Japan, the use of big data for smart roads, smart systems and smart data communications between the road and the users, and also communications between vehicles and infrastructure was found to be widespread. 
Big data platforms were also identified as ways of transferring information directly to drivers on accidents or incoming weather to prevent accidents or delays before they occur and further providing resilience at the network level. On the tour, we visited locations such as the Sawa Grand Bridge in South Korea, which has numerous sensors and collects data to monitor the stress levels on cables and the movement of bridges in, of the bridge in real terms, uh, in real time, sorry, due to severe weather and, and wind and other climatic events. And this information was then used in warning systems to assist road users. So in terms of robustness, this was a major focus on reducing the impacts of disaster and also maintaining ageing of infrastructure. Examples of effective classification of expressway damage and risk-based inspection strategies whereby structures are being maintained through periodic inspection and evaluation strategies were demonstrated. Also on the recovery side, there are examples of very quick and, and cost-effective uh, recovery, uh, which were identified as a result of earthquakes in Japan. And also on the adaptation side, the development of adaptation technologies, such as water retention pavements and porous asphalts to be used in flood prone areas, as well as heat shield pavements, which can drop the surface temperature by up to 10 degrees Celsius to reduce urban heat island effects. And all of this work will be addressed further by the RAAA committee. So this slide outlines the first task of the committee. We had our first meeting on uh, Friday the 26th of November, and this was attended by countries such as Japan, Taiwan, Indonesia, South Korea, and also Australia. Our first tasks which are underway are to complete a survey on climate change, resilience and emergency management, and to provide a basis for this information to then feed into the reports that need to be developed. The RAAA committee will also consider recommendations and issues identified throughout the scanning tour. So these include recommendations to, to further look at the big data and smart roads by way of enhancing V2V and V2I technologies. Also, the rapid recovery post natural and man made disasters will be looked at, and early warning systems for floods, earthquakes, storm surges, drought and how quickly to ensure that infrastructure and society are provided with information as quickly as possible will be, uh, will be looked at. Also the awareness and improvement of international standards and other crossover between adaptation technology and innovations will be looked at. So the collaboration between PIAC and RAAA is very strong. The establishment of related committees therefore allows the sharing of information and experiences on the topic of resilience. The RAAA committee has also been established with membership of chairs of the related committees, such as 1.4 myself and also 1.5 Yukio Adachi. And our role is to provide a liaison between the two committees and to ensure information exchange. Uh, this also includes the sharing of case study surveys, as I mentioned, and also case studies between the associations to enable a deeper exchange of knowledge. Uh, there are also a number of other opportunities which we've identified to, to further uh, work on the collaboration uh, through joint workshops and seminars between RAAA and PR uh, are proposed as this cycle progresses. And then also recently an article has been developed as part of the PR Roads Roots uh, magazine and this is uh, being coordinated together with uh, the RAAA country of Indonesia. So as you can see, there is a lot of work going on both individually by RAAA and also by PIAC and together across the associations on climate change and resilience. And we're really looking forward to the continued collaboration. Uh, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to include these in the chat and I'll be happy to answer them then. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline, for that uh, presentation. And uh, uh, now we'll be going into a short uh, virtual break. Um, this will give us time to interact with each other, to stretch our legs, uh, grab a quick coffee, 
uh, I do note that um, participants come from uh, different time zones across the world. So I know that, uh, for instance, some of our uh, delegates from New Zealand, it's um, 2.30 in the morning. So we will be cognizant of that and we will shorten the break um, to try and uh, allow people to go to bed uh, at the time that's uh, decent for them. So uh, there are three breakout rooms that you could choose to go to. Um, if uh, you'd like to discuss in English, uh, please stay here. If you'd like to discuss in French, there is, a, there is a link. It's also in the chat. You can just click that and you'll go straight to the um, uh, French discussion room. Uh, Spanish, do exactly the same thing. And uh, let's try to be back in about uh, five or so minutes. So take a break and um, see you back at um, 4.30. Oh, Thank you. Excuse me? Yes. Ah, yes, oh, before the going to the uh, breaking room, so the, uh, we would like to take a photo. Or the oh, yeah, group photo, yeah. Yes, Everyone, photo. turn on your cameras. Yes, please turn on the camera. Good time to smile. If you wouldn't like a photo of yourself taken, then uh, you could leave off your camera. Otherwise, it would be great if you could all turn on your cameras. Thank you so much. So the now is a, we will start the one pages. So the now is a eight pages. So please, please enjoy the uh, just the two or three minutes. Okay, okay. Let's get started. Please smile. Three, two, one. Okay, one page is finished. Okay, next page. I don't know the who is a who is a who's a page, so but please smile again. Okay, three, two, one. Okay, finish second page. Third page. Okay. All right. Okay, three, two, one, zero. Thank you. Okay, fourth page, three, two, one. I think that from the five to seven, uh, there is no photo, no, uh, no, no, no photo, so that uh, we don't need, so, okay. Thank you so much. We finished taking the photo. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So please go to whichever break, breakout room you, you prefer. There will be facilitators. And let's meet back in, um, it's now about five minutes. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. For the interpreters, can we stay here? Because there's a couple of uh, things not re working really, really properly. This is okay with you for one minute. Yes, you need us to say in English channel. Uh, yes, let me check. I'm in English channel now. Yes, I am. Patrick speaking. Okay. okay. Uh, so what do I need to do actually? Because on Zoom, I have on the back office of Zoom, um, Maya clearly is there. I think you can see, I'm showing my screen, so you can see her here, right? Yes. Is this correct? Mm. Hello, can you hear me? I'm one of the you English interpreters. Uh, it should be like Maria, that. I think it's has is not it been correctly. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. But I am Andrea. To... I'm, I am the Spanish English interpreter. What but do I need I'm... to do? What do I need mm. to do? Ah, it says Anglia Espanol. You need it's to put Francais, English, French. No, it's Spanish, ah, French. French, Espanol. It's That's okay. The problem. She's French. The wrong channel. French, yes. Or uh, Francais. Let me try again uh, because uh, that's a uh, um, mistake because she was. So. Yeah, there was a problem with the connection. So it's the last one French, French to Spanish. 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 Yeah. French Spanish, send the message again, right? 
I will stop sharing my screen. It's not very useful. Now. Okay. It should be good like that. So let's see. No. Yeah, I don't have any further options in Zoom here. No, now you have to send the link. And when she connects with that link, you have to. Yes, but I have sent the link already, right? Through okay. this menu. The link with this combination, right? Probably, yes. I don't see any other option to send the link directly, like through cut and paste. Uh, um, could you send that through the chat? I don't know the link. Uh, it's in Zoom. Okay, now yeah, you cannot see it. Yeah. I cannot see the link. No. Let's see if she receives it. Yeah. I see a Maria Ramayon connected as a regular delegate, it seems. Yes. But yeah, so she now should that be you configured see her, as a, you have to an assign her as an interpreter so that she sees the button but, and clicks on that. Yes, but how do I do that specifically? Because Wait, beyond I'm what checking done, if she received the mail. The same way you assigned us at the beginning. But I've already done that on the web page of the Zoom account. Yes, but now when she enters, she needs to see ah. the channels so that she accepts. So what do we have? Okay, folks, welcome along to the English session for a breakout area. We'll give it another minute until everyone else comes along and we're going to have a great chat, I'm sure. How's everyone getting on today who is still here? You all having fun? Oh. Hi, Greg. Hi, Craig. Bonjour. Ça va? Bonjour. Let's speak English, otherwise everyone will be super confused. <laughs> yeah. well, that, that's what I was kind of thinking for a moment there. I thought if we just quickly did, did a little bit of French, then people are going to pop on and go, hold on a minute, am I in the right room? Hey, Greg, how are you? Hi, Phil, how are you doing? Good, good. Sorry, can so I just we'll pass? Half past. Oh, yeah, go on. Oh, sorry, it's just I've joined, but my invite says that the English session's from two o'clock till five. But when I've joined, obviously, there's presentations ongoing. So I'm just wondering, is it only on from two to I, five or is it on all day? <laughs> I think it's it's all day. I think um, it's two to five East African time. So right. um, so uh, it's 11 o'clock UK time. Right. OK, that makes sense then. So, so that, that's for the next couple of days. We are actually well, running much more then because I've obviously missed a bit then. Yeah. <laughs> that's fine. OK, I'll join now. Thank you. We are running a little bit over time. Uh, we we will try to to finish on time. We might be a few mi minutes after uh, the the scheduled end of the session. So th this session is more or less to be like a, a sort of we're down the pub, we're having a conversation, we're chewing the fat. We're going to pose some questions. People can come in if they want. They can listen if they'd rather. But it's more about being informal and just having a conversation just to, to, to as Pat, uh, Mark Henry said, to stretch your legs. So one of the questions that I have to post to everybody uh, is what are the unique challenges in addressing or providing measures for road resilience in low and middle income countries? So, you know, that's quite a, a broad question right off the bat here. So does anyone want to come in and discuss that? I agree. No, I think yes. there's two things. With doing all the work in the last few years, uh, first thing is funding. Everybody says, where do we get the money? And is it going to be cost effective? And the second one is uh, so lack of knowledge, lack of asset management systems, things like that, which I was going to bring up in the panel discussion just now. But um, a lot of the 
African countries, for instance, have very rudimentary, if any, asset management systems. And without that, you, you're struggling right from the word go. So how, do, Phil, how would you go about breaking down those sorts of barriers to actually implementing good systems? What would, what would be the first step in that? I think the first one is, is to actually get some kind of a reasonable asset management system going because your vulnerability analyses and all things like that feed into your asset management. If you don't know what you got, you can't protect them, basically. But that still costs money. You know, everybody, well, everywhere where we've worked, they say, where do we get the funding? I mean, obviously, the donors are seeing it as more of a priority and starting to include it in part of the, the projects, on new projects, but the existing network is still a problem. Yeah, and I think that's something that uh, even um, in Scotland, we, we find that even though we do have an asset management system in place at Transport Scotland, understanding what your whole network is as well, I think it's, oh, hold on, uh, I've just got something in the chat. We need to start the panel session. So unfortunately, folks, I'm afraid I'm going to have to drop off and move into the panel session. So I will pass it over. <laughs> But thank you very much for listening to me talk for the best part of five minutes. And Phil, thank you for saving my skin. Thank you, Craig. And I apologize for this. Um, I hope that everybody's uh, returning from the other uh, breakout uh, networking sessions. And uh, just to introduce myself briefly, my name is Monica Stars, and I'm a, a study director uh, for policy studies at the Transportation Research Board in Washington, D.C. And today I'm joining you from Madrid, Spain. So um, I'm on the other side of the Atlantic today. Um, we are very lucky to have very, you know, six very highly regarded and, um, and well-known experts uh, that are gonna be joining us in this uh, panel discussion on the topic of uh, adaptation and resilience approaches to build and operate and maintain um, road networks. Before we move forward, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna introduce everyone uh, in the panel so you know who's gonna be uh, joining us. And then from there, we'll go into uh, a series of questions and panel discussion. Uh, let me start with uh, Vivian Dupont. Uh, Vivian is a research associate at the Institute for Climate Economics in France. Um, he is a French expert on adaptation to climate change, and he works with local authorities, utilities, and public financial institutions on their approaches to proactively increase uh, their resilience. Vivian holds a PhD from the University of Paris Saclay and a master's um, degree in environmental sciences from the University of Pierre and Marie Curie. Uh, he also holds a master's degree in environmental policy from Science Pro Paris. Um, another one of our distinguished uh, panelists is Dr. Alonso Somorin. He is a regional principal officer at the African Development Bank, and he leads uh, the bank's work on climate change and green works growth on my apologies, in the 13 countries of the Eastern African region. Uh, this includes supporting countries access to climate finance for implementing their Paris Agreement commitments and mainstreaming climate change uh, in all of the bank policies and programs. Um, I must say that under his supervision, he has directly been involved in the design appraisal and supervision of more than 150 uh, development projects that are worth over $13.4 billion, uh, US dollars, I must say. Um, Alfonso holds a PhD in international environmental policy, and he's an executive, uh, he's an alumnus of executive education in many leading institutions, including Cambridge and Oxford in the UK. Our next panelist uh, that would like to introduce you is Phil Page Green. Uh, Phil 
graduated with a Bachelor of Science with honors in a Master of Science from the University of Natal and a PhD from the University of Pretoria, all of them in engineer, engineering geology. He has a, a very interesting career. His career spans 37 years and he's had projects in uh, 27 countries. Uh, where he worked, uh, for, for example, he has worked with the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research in Pretoria, and um, he's also worked in Oman for a while. His expertise in most of his work has been primarily in research and implementation of materials aspects related to roads, road construction, uh, transportation, geotechnics, and climate resilience for the transportation network. He is retired, but of course he's uh, busy working uh, as a specialty consultant in geomaterials, among many other things. Our next panelist is, uh, you already know him, is Mark Henry Ruben, Ruben Uh He's the head of research and development at the Uganda National Roads Authority with the responsibility for research and innovation. Um, his focus is primarily on multidisciplinary issues, uh, including access, climate change, safety, gender, green growth, efficiency, sustainability, and resilience. And by the way, as uh, you've heard earlier this morning, he is the vice president elect to the World Road Association and the first delegate of Uganda, among many other things. And I might, I might say that being from the Transportation Research Board, I'm also proud to say that he's a member of the TRB International Coordinating Council, uh, among many other things. Um, Mark Henry uh, holds a PhD in civil engineering from the Catholic University of Lausanne in Belgium. Our fifth panelist is uh, Gerardo Flinch. Um, Dr. Flinch is a professor of engineering at the Department of Civil Engineering and Environmental Engineering at, the Virgi at Virginia Tech where he directs the Center for Sustainable and Resilient Infrastructure. He specializes in assets management, pavement engineering, infrastructure, sustainability, and resilience, as well as road safety. Um, Gerardo currently chairs the World Road Association Committee on Asset Management, and the TRB Committee on Pavement Condition and Evaluation. He's also the Vice President of FM Consultants. And our sixth panelist is Maya Sumel. Um, Ms. Sumel is the European International Bank's Transport Coordinator for Africa, the Caribbean, and the Pacific, with a focus on sustainable and resilient projects such as, for example, I'm going to give you an example. Uh, she's been working with the, in the uh, uh, Eastern Africa Transport Corridor. And as such, she follows the European International Bank's financing and technical assistance operations, as well as policy and strategy. Prior to her involvement in his cur her current position with the European International Bank, she was uh, an advisor for the bank management and held various positions with the Dutch government, where she was the Netherlands lead climate finance negotiator at the COP and the treasurer's, uh, treasury's uh, senior representative for donor engagement and investment uh, in development, sustainability, and energy. So now that everybody knows who their panelists are, uh, I'm going to kick off the discussion and I'm going to ask each of them to give us a few uh, remarks to start um, to, to answer the main question of this panel, which is how can adaptation and resilience approaches help road owners um, uh, and managers primarily to build, operate, and maintain their, their road networks that they own and operate? Uh, so let's see, I'm going to start with, uh, with Vivian, maybe you can start. Yes, sure. Uh, thank you very much for, for this introduction and uh, good afternoon, or oh, good day everybody. Uh, I think that there are many, uh, many important uh, aspects within those questions and I can only speak from uh, the context uh, I know best, but I'm pretty sure that uh, 
we, we, we learn from those contexts uh, many things. Aprendemos uh, de esos contextos muy very different uh, situations. Uh, the, the very first thing I, I, I would maybe underline is that uh, climate adaptation, uh, as you probably have discussed the whole day, uh, is first really a condition uh, for having um, like efficient and, um, and consistent uh, networks in the context of climate change. And uh, having a, an adaptation and a resilience uh, framework and a consistent approach uh, is really the basics for, uh, for meeting those, uh, those conditions. And the very first condition for that is probably um, the collaboration. Uh, for uh, resilience and uh, and adaptation, uh, as uh, I don't know in other uh, countries, but I know that in France or in Europe, adaptation has long been seen as a, a technical only issue. But as you um, uh, sorry, but if we go only for technical solutions, first you have only part of the solution for adaptation, and secondly, uh, you have only the most uh, expensive uh, parts of adaptation. And we all know that we cannot make all the uh, transport networks and infrastructure 100% robust to any kind of uh, climate hazards. So we really need to have an asset management approach and to prioritize and to define which type of adaptation we want to go for, which might be uh, really like investments to make the networks more robust or more uh, organizational uh, options, uh, for instance, by changing the operating doctrines or uh, changing the way uh, we uh, prioritize uh, some maintenance or the way we want to, uh, to, to organize some uh, services on the transport network. And the nose, for example. Servicios. Sorry. And uh, we see that when we go for these kind of solutions, uh, it's really a matter yes. of many, many uh, people within the transport uh, ecosystem, within the organization, and even including the different uh, stakeholders uh, of this ecosystem to, to define what's, what we really expect from a transport network in a changing climate. Tenemos que ver que podemos esperar. How to, to, uh, to, to make this uh, happen. So, just to summarize, and I think we will go further in the discussion later, but I really think that the basis for, for uh, an adaptation approach is uh, about collaboration to, to, to have this general uh, like enabling environment and governance. Avoir this entourage qui nous permet de mener à bien ces discussions et la première chose qu'il faut voir c'est ce liste d'expectatives pour pouvoir comprendre ensuite la relation entre le changement climatique et les réseaux de transport. Et je pense que cela est la base de n'importe quel plan de gestion d'actifs dans le contexte du changement climatique. Vraiment, pour pouvoir commencer la discussion, je fais cet apport. Merci beaucoup, Vivien. Alfonso, tu pourrais continuer, s'il vous plaît Oui, merci beaucoup. Et je, je suis content de pouvoir faire partie de cette conversation. Uh, just mentionado. To, to what we're talking about. To start off, we, we must understand that within the, con, within the broader notion of adaptation and road network, um, I consider that we must structure them into two pillars, under two pillars. First, there is adaptation for roads. And second, there's a notion of roads for adaptation. And I'm gonna explain that. Um, because we must also understand that under the changing climate, and this is particularly in the, on the African continent, um, and, and my colleague made a, a brilliant presentation highlighting some of these uh, fiscal challenges that we're seeing. Road infrastructures themselves are going to be exposed to these changes. And we have to think about road as an entity, 
DEPA donde se llama carreteras como una unidad para hacer estos cambios. Y los presentaciones, de la China, las técnicas que podemos ver para darle soporte a las carreteras que se tienen que adaptar al cambio climático. Pero el segundo punto es que las carreteras no son simplemente carreteras, no es una construcción que va de un punto al otro, sino que las carreteras son una infraestructura que tiene que facilitar muchos otros aspectos de la vida social. Y las carreteras son una oportunidad para poder contribuir a la resiliencia del de sector eh, económico y social. Entonces, eh, tenemos que poder con conectar lugares marginalizados para poder eh, vincular zonas económicas a través de la carretera, porque esto permite la creación de puestos de trabajo y todo tiene que ver con la dinámica social de la adaptación las carreteras y la resiliencia de las carreteras resultan ser un, un buen aporte, un buen factor que contribuye a la adaptación de la población. Entonces, algunas cosas que tenemos que hacer para eh, aportar en la adaptación al cambio climático tiene que ver con esto. Y lo que estamos hablando hoy tiene que ver con esto. Lo quiero vincular con algo que tenemos que pensar de manera diferente en buscar soluciones innovadoras a través, mirándolo a través del cristal del cambio climático. Y esto se puede aplicar en todos los sectores y en todas las regiones, no solamente en los países en vías de desarrollo. El segundo punto es la parte financiera. Necesitamos financiamiento. Las, estas carreteras adaptadas al clima puede ser que eh, tenemos una interferencia, tenemos una interferencia de alguna. Sorry about that. So financing is very important, and we need to look into how do we begin to build partnership. La financiación es muy importante para construir colaboraciones. Tenemos que pensar en asociarnos para tener los instrumentos disponibles. Y bueno, le voy a dejar aquí, pero supongo que vamos a continuar este debate. Muchas gracias. Sí, muchas gracias. Esto es una perspectiva muy importante de las adaptaciones. Las adaptaciones a, a las carreteras. Road owners and managers. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think in the, the fairly recent past, the last four, five, six years, we've seen over and over the impacts of wildfires, flooding, landslides, on uh, affecting roads, cutting off roads, causing um, interruptions in terms of social life, as well as costing a lot of money to repair. Uh, we need to adapt to try and minimize this as far as possible. And as I was discussing just now in the chat room and Vivian also mentioned, the asset management system is fundamental to all of this. We need to have a good asset management system linked to the vulnerability assessment so we can identify the problem areas and uh, prioritize them and get in there and sort them out first. And so a good example currently is the Western part of Canada. So um, I have a sister lives there, is cut off totally at the moment from her fam family. Um, and it's not totally unexpected, but it has happened and the consequences are having to be lived with. The main thing is to understand the processes and the implications. If we can do that, then we can get in and, and start sorting out the problems provided we have the money. And 
it's it's not a straight engineering problem. It's a multidisciplinary problem. We need the engineers. We need the geomorphologists. We need the hydrologists. We need the meteorologists. The combination of all the input from the different um, fields is required to actually identify and solve the problems. The engineering adaptation issue is, is the last one down the line, really, once you've understood the problem. And, and I think this is critical if we want the road owners to uh, end up with a resilient uh, road that will um, offer their users what they want. Okay, I think I'll stop there and we'll come back to the other questions later. Thank you, Phil. Um, yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a very good point regarding uh, the interdisciplinary nature of, of the solutions that need to be um, applied uh, moving forward. Um, Mark, Mark Henry, um, can you give us your insight? Yeah, thank you, uh, Monica. I would not like to repeat uh, any of my colleagues who have said uh, a number of things which I'd have wanted to say, uh, starting with Phil, you know, that uh, the engineering, the technical part is the easiest side of it, but that's where we tend to go fast. Um, and then two is in the, in the collaboration, then there brings in the whole aspect of just knowledge sharing. Um, there's there's uh, no need to reinvent the wheel for most of these challenges. Uh, when we think we've faced the worst, like in Uganda, you know, we've got landslides, or we've got uh, rising water levels uh, that are submerging roads for periods of the year. We just need to go to Mozambique or, or Bangladesh and find out that, oh, you know, these people have faced this for, for uh, decades, so we can learn from them. Uh, what have they done? So I see some of the key challenges as, um, as uh, where is the money? Where is the money? And uh, what motivates the money? Because the money can be found, but what motivates the money? Uh, if we can build a narrative around um, the interests of the, of the people who have the money and the people who control the money, so that's uh, the financiers and the politicians, uh, we can crack the more difficult parts of this equation. The easier one tends to be the, the technical, which is where uh, we tend to start. And I thought I should, I would take this opportunity actually to, to let us all know a bit more about the host organization, the Uganda National Road Authority. And uh, I won't uh, belabor who we are, but I'll bring it up in the context of um, the COVID-19 crisis and how we maintained uh, our asset in, in, uh, in um, um, good, good to fair condition. And so COVID-19 hits, it had uh, multiple impacts, you know, it affected the uh, staff, uh, health and safety, uh, the stakeholder relations that, that were involved. And then um, there was issues of access to the network when the, when the uh, whole country was, um, was locked down. And so what um, UNRWA as an organization did was it immediately uh, set up a business continuity management team and they come up with a response plan and so that ensured uh, the good health of staff, continuity of our business, balancing operation and um, with, with government directives, uh, national and international protocols. And we focused first on the staff. We didn't focus on, on the road and seeing that it's, it's all nice and maintained, but we focused fast on the staff uh, to see that our people were safe and uh, could then go on to implement their work in, in a safe regime. We focused on um, uh, projects because there's certain contractual obligations which could not be met for one reason or another, even, even though construction work could go on to maintain the, the infrastructure. Some people could not be flown into the country. And then we leveraged um, existing technologies. We set up um, ICT tools and, and uh, capability for remote working so that um, administrative tasks could be uh, handled without stepping into office so that um, uh, work on maintaining our assets would remain. And so in the context of, of this and, and ongoing resilience, then I see that um, COVID-19 is um, suppressing the world or, or subjecting us to some form of recession or other. Uh, we leave it to the economies to determine, but that is going to affect um, future funding priorities. 
And these are things we need to be cognizant of as we think about uh, asset management. You know, where is the money going to come from? Because governments and uh, development partners have less resources which they need to reprioritize and somehow maintaining the asset might fall off the radar. So even as we're thinking of what climate is going to do, just the resource base to address anything might be falling down. So I think I'll leave it at that for my opening remarks and um, hand over to you. Thank you, Mark. Well, Maya, could you give us some of uh, your insights, um, your perspective on, on this issue and how, um, how can adaptation or resilient approaches uh, help owners and, and managers of the road system? Sure, Monica, can you hear me? I'm also having some connectivity Perfectly, issues. yes. Wonderful. I've, yes. heard, uh, I've heard the request for, uh, for financing and, and how does money flow and how do funds flow a few times already. And I think I'm, I'm one of the few economists on this, uh, on this panel. And uh, of course, speaking from the U European Investment Bank's perspective and being part of uh, a working group of uh, multilateral development banks, um, perhaps you could give a bit of insight into that. So here at the EIB, we are currently looking at roads and road sustainability increasingly from a holistic lens, which by definition necessitates the collaboration in the broader sense. Um, within our department, my colleague Pierre Etienne Bouchot is currently leading work on this matter, which ties together all the values of sustainable roads from climate mitigation, adaptation, to resilience, to accessibility, to safety. So, which again, of course, links to broader questions of health, which is more and more in the forefront of our, our policymakers in the context of COVID. And I'm often asked, notably by our offices around the world, if we as big public multilateral banks will still be able to finance roads in the future with the current focus on climate change and greener, greener transport systems and competing budgets for health and COVID, for example. So the need to meet these climate and social commitments makes any kind of road-based assignment very challenging, to be very honest. Roads are held to more scrutiny, which in itself provides many opportunities to find synergies beyond adaptation or even climate change alone. Um, the fact that investments in road infrastructure promote economic growth, equality, and well-being, as Dr. Somerin highlighted, is particularly true in developing countries where this infrastructure is in need of renewal and repair. So in other words, there is a need to provide sustainable transport for all, which also includes well-preserved, cleaner, and more efficient roads, and where possible to build them back better. Also, in the context of a, of a just transition, multilateral development banks usually need to work together and provide technical assistance and financial support where needed as required by your partners. I've seen how this works, uh, for example, in Uganda, where um, I'm currently um, leading yeah, on the que está liderando muchos proyectos eh, que estamos llevando adelante. It takes a lot of planning, that's, that's true, and I hope we, we get to that later on in this, in this, uh, in this panel. Um, because it, it really does require a broader collaboration, a lot of planning, and a certain level of coherence also between stakeholders and financiers. So there is, there is a need to properly future-proof roads, not only to get the best out of asset investments, but to ensure that roads remain relevant in a world of seemingly competing priorities, also financial priorities. So it should be noted that the need and backlog for better road rehabilitation, maintenance and management, it's also been mentioned by one of, the, one of my predecessors. This need and backlog has been there for decades, both in the developed and developing world. Overall, there have been very low levels of sustainable road investments, even before climate change was such a high priority. So a lot of efforts are needed to reverse this downward trend. The deterioration of essential infrastructure assets is often sadly highlighted through deadly accidents. That's when we hear of them. And this draws attention to the very real problem of the deteriorating states of infrastructure caused by this low rate of renewal of life expired assets and exacerbated by insufficient and deferred maintenance. So at the European Investment Bank, we're trying to move away from focusing on greenfield investments and looking at a broader portfolio of, uh, of sustainable roads, which indeed includes um, rehabilitation and maintenance. So hopefully roads will be important for years to come to continue to, prov to provide lifelines, the provision of mobility, to weather climate change and social pressures. Um, I think one of the speakers already mentioned it earlier, we don't need to operate in a vacuum and we really need to coordinate better amongst ourselves, also as financiers. Um, and, and not just look at finance, I know finance is very, very important, but also in the context of investment requirements, design standards, 
um, it's it's important to to have these uh, components to really come to scale in terms of resilience and um, yeah in, in in prioritizing roads in in the broader sense and seeing it as a as a really good investment rather than just an add-on as Professor Page Green highlighted. Often it's still seen as an add-on, a cost that you add later. The same with the with with safety investments and there's so many synergies between adaptation, mitigation, safety, resilience. And I hope these are aspects that we can come back to uh, later in our panel. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Maya. Um, you know, Maya, you've been talk, you've been focusing primarily on finance because that's your background, but on other aspects that you've been talking um, right now. But I was I was going to ask you and ask the rest of the panelists. Um, how do you how do you think how, how do you think that both climate change and resilience in a general you know, perspective should be included early enough in the process to make sure that we, you know, as, as transportation experts avoid mistakes in the planning. I mean, it's a big question. And I guess we've been talking about collaboration. We've been talking about the technical side, the financing side, but what are your, what are your perspectives of, you know, we're starting a new project we're starting the planning. What is where are the things that an owner and a manager should be thinking about? Uh, who wants to start? Anybody? Volunteers? Maybe Mark? Yeah, I'll, I'll go first. Um, and uh, it's a very important it's a very important observation you make. I mean that that question is is uh, is very very important because uh, we all know oh should know that um, uh, studies show that uh, every dollar uh, proactively spent in making our infrastructure more resilient, most likely it's going to spend, it's going to save up to six, five, six dollars in, in um, rework and, and future repairs. So it's, it's very important that um, this question is uh, looked at. And um, what I would say is, uh, yes, we all talk about um, climate resilient design because you really have to start this process as early as possible. Uh, but then that, that comes across uh, when we're talking about low and middle income countries. Economic development going on, uh, let alone saying this infrastructure should be there for X amount of time. That tends to be a secondary kind of question which shouldn't quite be. So what I would say is uh, we've got to consider resilience uh, early in the game, but we've got to have um, options. We've got to have, uh, um, should I call them staged uh, adaptation approaches so that we can start with, uh, with the low cost, with the low cost um, um, options as a first line of fundamental protection. And then, um, Asset, asset owners then can explore strategies of uh, building on to these uh, gradually. Because uh, the challenge tends to be in authorities like ours, if, uh, if we want to then uh, make our roads resilient or adapt them for climate change, then the cost just shoots through the roof and nobody is going to finance it. But if we say, okay, we're going to stagger this, we're going to just maybe change the drainage improve the drainage or we're going to do this we're going to stagger it a little bit um, the pain is less but the the payoff is huge so i think that's the way to go that's that's, that's a great perspective um olufonso you're you've been working with oh, actually phil i think you're you're ready to phil yeah sorry yeah. um <laughs> and then we'll no, go I, to olufonso <laughs> I agree with uh, um, Mark Henry. Uh, there's two issues. Obviously, one's existing road network, and probably the most important thing to make it resilient is to maintain it properly. If we neglect the maintenance, the resilience drops off exponentially. Cracks in the road, unclean drains, things like that. The second issue is new roads and improved upgrades and things like that. Uh, and again, it's probably a good idea to have an experienced climate resilient engineer reviewing all designs and looking at them specifically in terms of resilience, highlighting areas that 
could be improved, not necessarily a great cost, but just highlighting the problem areas. And then again, during construction, what we never see is a resident engineer out on the road when it's raining in the middle of a heavy storm. And that's when you can see exactly what's happening. Where's the water going? Where are the problem areas? And that should be a part of the project that there should be a, a separate report at the end in the as built um, drawings and, and stuff of the engineers visit during storms along the entire section of the road. But as Mark Henry said, it's really good engineering. That it needn't cost a lot of extra money, particularly things like drainage, which are critical. And if we get the drainage right, we're solving probably 80 or 90% of the problems. Okay. Thank you so much, Phil. Alfonso. All right, thank what you. Are your uh, good point. Um, thanks, Mark and, and Phil. Good point indeed. Just in addition to that, um, Monica, let me start by saying we have a good disadvantage in Africa. And the key word, good disadvantage, um, because as we speak now for a population, a continent with a population of um, over a billion people, only 17% of the total infrastructure are currently in place. For Africa to reach a development, a developed country or region status, we have a gap of 83%. And now that's a very good uh, problem to have because you can start doing things differently from this point forward. You're not locked in into an infrastructure framework that makes it very difficult to make changes. So you have a lot to build. So we want to build differently going forward. 83% is quite a huge um, gap to fill. Um, and we need to do that at scale and we need to do that quickly. The second point again is that, um, you know, I like what Mark said, we need to start this at the design level. But let me also say we need to start this at the policy level. I would love to see climate change departments or climate change teams within Ministry of Roads and Transport in many African countries. And so that at the level where you're designing your road strategy, your road policy, you already integrate in that. It becomes part of your business as usual that you do things differently. Now on the ground, the solution is engineering and I agree to that as well. Um, but also we must be able to link this conversation you know, to the global conversation around climate change. What we think on the finance side is the more we can make the case for climate resilient road infrastructure, the more we can have access to these climate funds that are out there. And I like to say this, the quantum of money that we need to solve this problem on the continent, it's already existent in the global economy. The challenge that we have is distribution. So we don't need to print more money. We have enough money in the global economy to solve the problem. The challenge is distribution. And in order to solve the distribution challenge, you must be able to make a very solid business case. And I like what, and, and that comes down to what Henry and Mark said again. Heli warning system, you know, and the, the cost of actions now, uh, they have a long-term benefit of saving us down the line. So. If any one of you haven't seen the report done by the Global Center for Adaptation, and they said for every one dollar you spend on adaptation, particularly in the early warning uh, spaces, you can potentially have a benefit of anything between seven to ten dollar in return. And those are the kind of narratives that we need to continuously use when it comes to uh, building resilience in our infrastructure network. Thank you. That's, that's, that's very, those are very good points regarding the new, having a new, you know, new type of framework um, as we move forward. Uh, in addition to what Phil was talking about earlier uh, regarding the importance of engineering and maintenance, then tied to finance and, and everything else. We go back to the issue that we were talking about earlier um, that all of you pointed out that is such an inter interdisciplinary uh, area where all of these issues need to be brought to bear to really make sure that the next steps are done the right, the right way. And that brings me, uh, Vivian, you're an expert in uh, collaboration. And maybe you have some thoughts on how actually can you, we can use collaboration to actually make 
all of those parts come together in a cohesive way, in a way that um, they can really propel us uh, in the right direction. Yeah, I, I really think that the, the first uh, the first element of answer to your to your question on, on how to uh, how to avoid mistakes in planning is really uh, made of all the insights from the, the first round of question when we we really all of us uh, insisted on the on those early stages and, and conditions to make sure that this question of the consequences of climate change and adaptation could be taken into account when uh, designing and managing uh, the network. So I really want to stress on that again, as um, it's also part of the, the, the necessary um, investment and time to, to, to take for those uh, really real early stages. Uh, it takes time, it takes like expertise, uh, but it's a big part uh, of, uh, of the solution. But to, to, to provide, to, to go one step further and try to provide some inputs on your question on how to, uh, to include the, the, this uh, question uh, early enough to, to avoid mistakes. Um, I, I think that uh, Phil uh, mentioned um, the question of uh, the, uh, knowing the, the vulnerabilities. And I think that having a collective and sharing a collective knowledge of the relationships between the transport system and the climate is really, really the, 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 the first and very like necessary uh, step. Uh, what we see on the field when we go and when we talk with uh, infrastructure manager, when we talk with uh, worlds or, or other transport uh, manager is that even for the existing and all the networks, this knowledge about the relationship between the climate and the infrastructure is very barely well um, like consolidated and well known and well uh, followed for a very simple reason, which is that the, the climate was something stable until now. And we do not really monitor, we do not really uh, try to, uh, to, to remote uh, something which is not changing. Now the climate is changing. There is a very first step of sharing, not having just in like a technical uh, service, but really sharing this knowledge about how the climate is uh, affecting, is, uh, is interacting with uh, the road uh, network. Then when we have this knowledge uh, on the, the current uh, vulnerability, uh, we can start to think in a more uh, forward-looking basis on how this will a relationship may evolve with the climate change. To do that, we can use, if we have some uh, climate projection or scientific knowledge about the future climate, but we can also start with what happens on the field, on the ground at the moment, what are the, the, the more recent uh, historic events, uh, try to see, try to conduct um, uh, reports after events, and try to understand how what happens and try to start to raise questions on what could go worse. How, how can climate change change this relationship and try to, to stress this relationship to understand what could happen and then raise as early as possible the questions and keep all the options uh, available. That's something we have said at the beginning that there are technical options and engineering, of course, but there are maybe also organizational options or uh, changes in the way we, we operate the network. And making this exercise really collectively help to, to keep all those options uh, open and to, to, to prioritize and to, to make the trade between them. That's what I, I would answer to your question. Thank you so much, Vivian. Uh, Maya, uh, with, with your all your experience and work that you've done, uh, both for the European Investment Bank and, and for the government of the Netherlands, um, what is what is your perspective on on, on on this particular topic? What is the importance of collaboration uh, for adaptation and increased resilience? Um, I think, yeah. both at, the, at the different levels, but you know your your perspective is broader. It's more at the at the uh, European level and and governmental level. I wanted to highlight that preparation more and more is not just a technical thing anymore, but it's increasingly multidimensional. 
And as one of my one of our colleagues mentioned, um, finance, especially climate finance, is often driven by policies rather than engineers. A lot of economists there, a lot of social geographers like myself. Um, so it is it is important to have preparations done as early as possible. But what I what I see in the projects that I've been responsible for um, is that when you don't get components of sustainability early on, and I, I mean sustainability in the broader sense, economic efficiency, adaptation, uh, the environment, safety issues, you, you end up having projects that take twice as long, literally twice as long, and that cost twice as much. And we have to keep going back uh, to our board, we have to keep going back to our financiers, trying to find money for this, whereas, as our colleague from the African Development Bank said, you can save so much money by having this upfront and by including it in the planning stage, not just in the planning of the project, but maybe in, in the planning of your pipeline. So apart from merging together the, uh, the, the road authorities and the ministries of infrastructure and ministries of transport with the climate ministries also to involve the budget ministries and the treasuries, because they are the ones that are going to make space in the budget to to include this ex ante as, as as part of a good investment a sound investment and and i take i take on board what uh, what was said that developing countries often have very limited resources and i think it's important to highlight that also in the context of a just transition investments from the development perspective should also take this into consideration we're trying every day to, to find resources for technical assistance, for grants, not just for projects themselves, for investment grants and for capacity building, but also more and more upstream um, to have sectoral dialogues with, with partner countries and with other MDBs to ensure that this is something that's included early on, early on in the process. Because we see that when things are an afterthought, they just increase exponentially the time, the effort, and the funds that are needed to, to bring projects to completion. And another thing is also that there's quite a focus on greenfield investments, whereas we see that indeed, um, when you look at rehabilitation, when you look at heavy maintenance or periodic maintenance, these are the low cost uh, measures of, of, of prolonging um, the, the, the life, of, the economic life of projects. And also want to take to take on board what Professor Green had mentioned. I, I remember one of my projects is a road in Liberia that's 47 kilometers long. Driving one way took me 30 minutes because it was dry. Going back took us three and a half hours, and we almost slammed into a truck with our four by four vehicle that couldn't steer. So it is it it has all this dimension, and and of course we need the engineers to tell us how to do better, but. I think just having this and, and also making it more visible for the outside world is very important. Just to show the problems, the challenges. I think people often forget that some of the wettest countries are in Africa. It's not just the drought, it's also the, the precipitation and it's the, there, there are so many challenges and, 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 and each continent and each country has, has their own um, specificities. And it, it's good also to celebrate the successes and to highlight the challenges that we, that we face. So that's it. Uh, that's it from our side. And uh, but I absolutely take it on board that more and more, a lot of financiers are asking for all these add-ons. As of now, often they're seen as add-ons. And in the context of this transition, I mean, we we do we do understand that there is a, there is also a need for financing, and not just for investments, but for everything else around it, from planning to technical assistance to capacity building, monitoring how our roads um, how our roads maintained, how our roads operated. Um, yeah, the, the, there are very, very many aspects to this, and I know it, it seems daunting at, at, at certain times, but gosh, I hope, I hope many countries such as Uganda, um, where I have, I have really good projects, I hope that they leapfrog a lot of the mistakes that we have, have made in Europe, and uh, I think that's also why we're here today to learn from each other. Thank you. Thank you, Maya, and actually, I, I was very intrigued by what Mark uh, mentioned earlier regarding the experience with COVID-19 and um, how you manage uh, the situation. And I was wondering, uh, we've been talking quite a bit about either climate change or extreme events, but ultimately transportation is here and the roads are here to serve a population. I mean, to serve a function, uh, to provide a service. They're not just, as I think was Ulofonso mentioned earlier, they're not just there just to build a road. Um, so I was wondering how, how you think that 
we could think of the, you know, the issue of resilience and increasing resilience in a broader sense to make sure that um, those roads are actually serving the public um, in a bigger spectrum of potential issues that could bring about, um, uh, in which, you know, just to make sure that, you know, COVID-19 COVID is being a perfect example when, you know, we've, we've been locked down across the, the, the world and, um, but our roads are still needed maintenance and they still needed to provide a service. Uh, any thoughts? Uh, Mark, you pointed out earlier, but I wonder if the others have any thoughts on that. I can do a very quick remark to, to start. Thank you, Vivian. Uh, that's, I, I will be really, really brief on that point, uh, but I really think what we observe is that uh, with those uh, two years we've been all living and we're still living, uh, there is one point which is it's much easier to talk about resilience because we all understand uh, what it is about. And I think if we, we've learned something, or at least I hope, is that uh, we have, and that's very, very uh, complicated, but we have to get prepared to be surprised. And this is part of the difficult thing in planning for resilience is that it's not planning for one specific uh, scenario or event uh, which is actually uh, foreseen and well understood but we have to be prepared to to, to be surprised and surprised in that again and maybe again and uh, we can have like uh, combinations of different events and we can have both at the same time uh, and weather events with another kind of disruption and uh, we of course cannot plan for everything, but we have to, to get this mindset and those uh, tools and organizations to, uh, to, to cope with that kind of uh, surprises. Yeah, that's a very good point uh, regarding um, cascading effects in a sense, that's what you're talking about. Um, one, one event producing another and, and compounding the issues. Um, we are all, we're 25 minutes uh, past the hour, but um, this has been a very interesting conversation. And um, I don't see any questions in the chat, but um, since we're gonna have to be closing this here pretty fast, um, I was wondering if I, any of the panelists would like to give some final thoughts that you think that are, you know, something that you want the, the attendees to take away with them. Maybe a couple of things that you say, this is so important, please do not forget. Yeah. Who wants like, to volunteer first, Phil? Yeah, just to fill in a, yes. uh, a comment you mentioned earlier about the communities, the roads are for communities. But in terms of the collaboration, I think one thing we often forget is when we look at the resilience measures, and there obviously some roads are not going to have much done to them, so their resilience is quite low. I think the communities in those areas need to be informed and say, look, look there's not money for this. Um, if we have big storms or fires or whatever, this is these are the implications and let the communities understand right from the word go. I, I don't think we're actually doing enough of that at the moment either. Okay. Thank you so much, Phil. I think my my one thought would really be it's been a great discussion and it's been a great um, uh, seminar thus far. Uh, the challenge for me has always been, and it's been that way for very many years. Who is in the room? Do we have all the people who we're talking about that you know the stakeholders, the consultation that are going to turn the wheels? So we had one government minister. Um, Payak has about 122 countries, so maybe let's say he represents them. We've got two representatives of uh, MDBs. We don't have a bilateral donor here. Uh, we've got some road agencies. I'm not too sure we have an NGO here. So the point is, um, how can we broaden these kind of discussions so that uh, the right people are all in the room and we're discussing the issues and somehow we come to what we feel is a consensus position and then we move forward. 
because I think that is sometimes the challenge. Uh, if we don't have everybody in the room, um, then when the rubber hits the road and we've, we've got to get these things implemented, the tough decisions cannot be taken because some people have not had the decision, the discussions they should have had. So those are my parting thoughts. That's, that's a very good point. And then you get to surprises when you say, oh, this person was not in the room and surprise. That's a very good point, Mark. Uh, on the council, please. Yes, um, so two points for me quickly. Uh, number one, the, the multidisciplinary nature of road investment, as we've all agreed here, also helps us to understand that it's, there's also a multi-stakeholder uh, system behind it. You know, um, as we bring about the engineering, the sociology, the anthropology, history, whatever, into it, we must also understand that there are multiple stakeholders uh, in a typical road project and, and getting them on board even before design at the point of um, even conceptualizing it to the point of financing, at the point of project appraisal, implementation, supervision, and maintenance is very important. Um, I suppose we build it for them, you know, and then we've done our part. It's very important to that they, they have a sense of ownership to that infrastructure and they have a commitment to keeping it. And, and that for me is important. And, and number two, again, is, you know, if you ask a, 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 tip, a layman, what is the good of a road? You think you, it's for people, for cars to drive, you know, for you to travel from one point to the other. But roads are becoming the connecting power um, to markets, to healthcare centers, you know, from rural to urban, from Perry to center, um, from where the opportunities are to where the opportunity, from where the opportunities are limited to where the opportunities are. So, and I think we must understand this, you know, multifunctionality of roads and be able to do that. So if you are going to need, it doesn't matter if the road is gonna be, you know, a bit shorter uh, compared to a typical road, as long as it can connect more people, it can become an investment into improving lives and livelihoods. I think that for me should be, how we see it, particularly in the African context, particularly so in the African context. And, and, and I think it's one thing that um, I'd like the, 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 the participants to, to, to take away from this. Thank you. Thank you, Alfonso. Uh, Maya? Thank you very much. Uh, closing word. It's, it's been a very, a very interesting session, I think, and I've enjoyed very much hearing what my other colleagues have said. And I think what I would like to impart as a last thought is the social uh, component of what we are trying to do. Um, as, as you rightly mentioned, this is this roads, uh, sustainable roads, uh, climate adapted roads are in service of the people. And there's been a lot of research that um, roads that are climate relevant are often also more just. Uh, they provide greater accessibility. They provide more safety. There are so many uh, dynamics between these different values that, that take off so many SDGs and open so many gateways to, um, to, uh, to funding, such as the EU Global Gateway, I think it's a 300 billion euro fund that's now being discussed for continental Africa here within the EU. So there, there are just so many opportunities. I see that in maintenance, for example, women are often the ones that are driving, driving the force, whereas the roads is often a male dominated field. So there are so many things that we can link to sustainable and climate relevant roads. And we should just, um, we just should collaborate as broadly as we can and include all the, the people that we can around the table to make sure that everyone is working towards this, also in support of the asset managers who, who really need our support. Thank you. Yeah. And Vivian. Uh, yes, thank you very much. And uh, the, the last point from Maya is really, really insightful. Thank you. Uh, I, I don't think I have any like additional elements. I think we had all the, the, the key words in, in this discussion. If we, if we just recall like collaboration, multidisciplinarity, asset management, putting like intelligence early enough in the projects, we have all the, the ingredients. Uh, then the, the, the challenge of course is to, to, to manage to, to take them on board uh, in uh, daily uh, operations and with the, the, the right decision makers, as uh, Mark uh, remarked. So I, I think I, I will stop there. We have everything here. 
Great. Well, I want to thank all five of you. Thank you so much, Maya and Vivian, Alfonso, Mark, and Phil. It's been a great discussion. And um, I think we're going to conclude the session. Um, and um, looking forward to the rest of the, uh, the conference. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Monica, for a brilliant moderation. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Thank you very much, you. Monica. So, uh, Thanks to all the panelists. Thank you very much. So, a couple of closing words, uh, as uh, Mark and Carolyn have invited me uh, to, to, to uh, congratulations, everyone, to the organizers and to the speakers and the panelists. It's really, really an exciting day. Uh, sorry for the, uh, uh, the issues with the interpretation. Too many options in Zoom. That's the source of confusion. At least tomorrow it will all be sorted. Uh, and talking about of tomorrow, let's meet again tomorrow at the same time. Uh, same link, uh, I think. And uh, I hope uh, that everyone will have time to think about questions and remarks to share with everyone tomorrow. Thank you. Mark, Caroline, anything to add? I just wanted to say a big thank you to all the distinguished speakers uh, for your informative presentations and to all the panellists as well for the great discussion. Uh, thank you again to everyone for attending today and really looking forward to seeing you all again tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.